Welcome to MIT and this event on the Uyghur crisis in China. On behalf of the Center for International Studies, I'm John Tierman, and we welcome you to this half-day session, two panels, uh, and uh, plenty of discussion on this very important and urgent issue. Firstly, I uh, thank the co-sponsors of this event, uh, RADIUS at MIT, Harvard's Committee on Inter-Asian and Altaic Studies, Harvard FXB Center for Health and Human Rights, MIT Student Activities Office, and the uh, Center's Human Rights and Technology Program, and I particularly also want to thank Michelle English and Laura Kerwin, as always, uh, to organize this event and the series of star forums throughout the year. And I believe this is the last star forum of this academic year. And I invite you to uh, check our website in uh, late summer for the autumn events to come. Also, uh, a welcome to our live streaming audience on Facebook and a video which will be posted uh, in a matter of a few days. We have a very full schedule, which I'd like to get to very quickly today. It will include two panels of scholars and uh, one, the, the, the first one in a, in a few moments, but uh, I want to point out that we will have uh, a question and answer period after each of the two panels. And uh, we should come to the microphones in the aisles. Um, I think it's quite important in a, in a fraught and somewhat emotional issue like this that we uh, feel free to state our views, but we respect uh, free discourse and civil discourse throughout the day. Um, and we will be mindful of that in all cases. The, uh, uh, the two panels then will be followed by uh, a breakout session for those of you who want to continue discussion and particularly those of you who wish to consider next steps uh, to act on the things that you uh, have heard today. And that will be down here in this room uh, for about uh, 30 minutes or so after the last Q&A and um, panel. So without uh, further ado, as I say, I, I wish to introduce um, the, uh, I have to say, extraordinary young woman who has organized this conference, a senior here at MIT, um, who really has been the, the, uh, the spirit and, and moving force behind our gathering today, Zuli Mamat. You guys hear me? Cool. Thank you uh, for gathering here today for the conference on the Uyghur Human Rights Crisis. Um, my name is Uli, and like Dr. Tierman said, I'm a senior studying biological engineering here at MIT and doing neuroscience research at Harvard. I just want to echo again Dr. Tierman's thanks to our co-sponsors. With the efforts of both MIT and Harvard, we're able to bring all of our six speakers here today. So welcome, and thank you for being here. I want to start the conference with a saying from the Chinese Confucius literary tradition, a saying that I heard from my parents growing up as part of my Uyghur character, a saying that I came to learn and understand as the core teaching in, of many religions and at the heart of cultures around the world, and that is never impose onto others what you would not choose for yourself. Or in Chinese, 己所不欲，勿施于人. 
So this responsibility that we have to respect with an open mind the dignity of each individual by pl placing ourselves in their shoes taps into the hardwired depth of our empathy. Therefore, I invite you to begin this dialogue of understanding our role in witnessing a violation of an entire people's human dignity, the loss of the chance of growing up, knowing who you are or where you're from, of knowing the safety or whereabouts of your loved ones, of peacefully graduating, getting married, having children, or even the simple feeling of warmth as you close your eyes when you face the sun. So why are we here? Since the summer of 2017, we have seen from world media, US congressional hearings, and human rights organizations, alarming reports of massive internment of millions of people mostly Muslim, primarily of Uyghur ethnicity, but also Kazakhs and Kyrgyz, in Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, located in Northwest China. Under the eyes of the world, Chinese authorities have turned Xinjiang into a most heavily surveilled police state. In response to the reports of the massive internments, people in positions of China, power in China first denied the existence of such centers, as can be seen from the Consul General of China in Kazakhstan stating, in quote, we do not have such an idea back in February 2018. Once evidence started to pile with pictures and testimonies, they then changed their narrative and said that these internment camps were a poverty alleviation measure. And less than a month ago, China's Ministry of Foreign Affairs stated, in quote, building vocational, education, and training centers in Xinjiang is a preventive measure and is totally legitimate. Perhaps what's more disheartening is best encapsulated when a Beijing-based anti-terrorism expert stated in the Global Times, in quote, by giving people who have been influenced by extremism a new chance in the training centers, their human rights have also been prote protected. So with that, let's take a glimpse at what really happens within the walls of those training centers. Here, I would like to show you a short excerpt of, a tes of testimonies coming from three camp survivors. My name is Mehri Gultursun, and I am 29 years old. I am a Uyghur. Over the last three years, I was taken to China's government detention centers three times. I spent a total of 10 months in the camps. In May 2015, I returned to China from Egypt, where I studied English. I was arrested at the airport, and my two-month-old triplets were taken away. The officers handcuffed me put a dark sack over my head and took me to a detention center. My oldest son had died in their hands. In April 2017, I was taken to a detention center for the second time. I was interrogated for four days and nights without sleep. After being in the camp for three months, I kept having seizures and losing consciousness. I was finally released to a mental hospital. In January 2018, I was detained for, th for the third time. They put chains on my wrists and ankles, put a black sack over my head, and it took me to a hospital. I was stripped naked and put under a big comp computerized machine. Then I was dressed in a blue uniform with yellow vest, worn by serious criminals and taken to a camp. There were around 60 people in one of the cells where I was held. At night, 15 women would stand up while the rest of us would sleep sideways. And then we would rotate every two hours. Some people had not taken a shower in over a year. They forced us to take unknown pills and to drink some kind of white liquid. 
The pill caused us to lose consciousness and reduced our cognition level. The white liquid caused loss of menstruation in some women and extreme bleeding in others and even death. I also experienced torture in a tiger chair the second time I was detained. I was taken to a special room and placed in a high chair. Bands held my arms and the legs in place and tightened when they pressed a button. The guards put a helmet on my shaved head. Each time I was electrocuted, my whole body would shake violently and I could feel the pain in my veins. I thought I would rather die than go through this torture. I begged them to kill me. In another cell where I was held, there were 40 women aged between 17 and 62. When I left the cell after about three months, there were 68. Most of them were educated professionals such as teachers and doctors. I witnessed nine deaths in my cell in three months. I cannot imagine how many deaths there must be in all camps. I still remember the words of the officers when I asked what my crime was. They said in code, being a vigor is a crime. Simam Gulbahar, Tubular Mananus, Tulukus Gayerms, Kazakhstan, Almutu Sheridan, Man to Zen Fijerachi, Shkimon Oyetin Chile, Deshin China, Jigramishksi, Man Taira, Deslap Kurdam, Akhapetim, Tijerat Plan, Salik the Minut Ipket is Sachla, Sora Rambus Swalla Bada. Akırpla mene türümünü çeke, ladırını çeke solaplı koydu. Üçer içimden gözüm yaştın. Kırgan yeri yok. Yaş küçük ölse. Jigırm otuz adam bir kamırı yan solaydı. En kırk adam bu gitmesin. Bir kamırsa küçük. İgizliğe altı metr. Ya kün gömeğimiz yenim yok. Deriz küçük. Deriz aşı igiz bir yada. Kırk adam bayada uzunluğu yetti metr. Sen kendi. Manda manda toğursa 3 metr çıkıdı. 7 metrniki bir yerini oborna. Bu oborna saplı enek yazgan. Nimiş gelsiniz aşaqta o ta taratamız so. Başqa bir işlar qımsın da aşaqta enek qıvetken. Aşaqta ta çoşqlağa dənjlər biz televizorlar görətib çoşqlaq manda qıyıb verdi. Aşaq bir kiçikkinə tümü işik var. Tüm eşikte kiçik bir namla tüşük var. Az tüşükten çiğnek ne kitla? Başta Türk ya vakti yarım yer tökül kitudu biz toymayımız. Yarım yer tökül kitudu yarım çiğnek tökülü. Az ne kızla hemimiz ki kendisla hemimiz ki tam böyle elde bir stakan var stakan yarımdan hemimiz ki karşı manda büyük yerdi. Bizlerimiz pişlim kette mina çiçim uzun te mana çiçim ne çürüvet? Hemimiz mana çiçim çürüvet ki pişlim. Yarım o kette üstü bir şey sap yara kaç çık O tut yaştın, toksa yaş kıça. Eşek ayalı, kızlar bizi zıqlar. Birbirimiz təsirli kılıp, bol da az kaldı zıqlmanı. Üyümüz kısak salada çıxı gidiyordu, ortadık. Ben eşek de. Jigirim tört saat sonra kılıyım. Ya su bana, işim bana. Kolumdu koyza. Tömür üstelde ortadık, putumdu koyza. Ah tömür. Tümün içinde putlu kırgız rakı, küçük çocuk bağışla git başta kodadık. Jigerim tört saatten sonra kıldı. Şu doktor kandı tört katem yattı, hoşum da gitti. Doktorla kırsa biz hemimiz düm yatımız başta, düm yatımız. Evet. Doktor işini yuvan içip, doktorla her birimiz aldığımız bir tal doktor geledi. Bırak az sakçıla ahtamatına bile geldi. Biz ağırık tutsa, hemiye tömür tutsa, hemiye tömür işi tutsa biz ne kıç gidelim. Sonra da bu açık gitti, kiyemi yok. O kirmeydi. O kirmeydi. O ya ne yaket bilmeyiz. Sonra da bu açık gitti. Ya da kırdım beter oldu. Benim doktor kana. Doktor kana desi hiç kim bamaydı. Abdüveli's account of his treatment within the walls of the facilities is horrific. First day is very bad. The first thing they ask me to took off my clothes, strip off my clothes, and they slap my 
slept by Batik. They abused me. More than 20 Chinese guys. When you say they abused you, how? That any man cannot accept that. You're saying so, they raped you? Yeah. So I cannot... I can't forget that I didn't tell anybody. Up till, until now, I hadn't tell anybody. Because I'm... I feel shame. In the morning, three police asked me, one day, if you guys in power, what you will, what you will do to us? I said, look, I'm a human being. I'm not an animal like you. What followed, he says, was more violence, this time at the hands of inmates. They put me in the cell with the drug addicts and with the killers. And they beat me. Like, 24 hours. And where were the guards? Where were... The guards? Don't care. They want you to be tortured like this. If you tortured a lot, it means that you cooperate with them during the interrogation. Abduweli believes the rapes and beatings were orchestrated to force him into admitting he was a terrorist. I'm a scholar, I'm a writer, and um, I have never thought about that. I'm not a terrorist, I'm not a separatist, and what I confess. 101 East interviewed more than a dozen other former detainees. All share similar stories of abuse. These are the stories of only three individuals. Now, imagine the unheard voices of millions of people surviving every second in such enclosures. Imagine students and pro professors, teachers, academics, punished for striving for truth and knowledge. Imagine mothers and fathers robbed of the chance of embracing their children and kiss them on the forehead on their wedding day. Imagine toddlers systemically engineered to become orphans, stripped from their parents, community, and identity. So why are people in position of power in China committing such atrocious crimes. Here, I want to introduce just some context to the conflict. Since Xi Jinping's announcement of the Belt and Road Initiative back in late 2013, Xinjiang became a core region with its strategic location along 5,600 kilometer border with eight nations. And in addition, its vast mineral reserves. Simultaneously, Chinese authorities res resorted to a narrative of legitimizing its surveillance and mass internment on the basis of countering three forces, namely terrorism, extremism, and separatism. Now, like many violent and confusing times in history, such de-extremification efforts did not differentiate targeting thousands of people just like you and me. Students, scholars, academics, artists, who are not at all involved with such forces. These individuals that you see in these hundred posters that are around the wall today are right now at this moment held in such enclosures. All of them influential in their respective academic and artistic fields. In the words of Abdullahi from the video, what did they do wrong? As we celebrate our scholars' drive for excellence in academic institutions like MIT and Harvard, Chinese authorities are persecuting and targeting Uyghur scholars 
for the same efforts. Yet, as I was, we were together preparing for this conference, many times I was asked the question of whether or not I was ready to take such a stance in such a controversial issue. But where is the controversy? Our UN reportings of millions of people taken into concentration camps, a controversy. Our satellite images of vastly expanding construction of the enclosures, a controversy. Has our oath of never again in this society a controversy? We are here to analyze how once such a human atrocity is reframed as controversial, it automatically lends itself to be, to be questioned on the basis of its legitimacy. Yet, we're not gathered here today to explore the existence of the centers. We are also not here to tell one side of the story because there are no sides. When a man gets raped by 20 men because he was a teacher whose only crime was his will and devotion of his life to educate Uyghur children to fulfill their dreams. We are also not here to explicitly condemn officials. However, we are here to figure out what bridges we can build instead. We are here to bear witness to the undeniable evidence of the violation of human rights happening in Xinjiang. We are here to analyze how our seemingly benign academic, technological, and economic collaborations and contracts with China may be inadvertently fueling this crisis in human dignity, love, and respect. Now, I will focus my talk on the second aim of the conference, and that is to open a productive dialogue amongst ourselves in understanding how technology is not used, but abused by the Chinese authorities, and thinking more broadly about how technology is deployed in society at large. Today, China leads the world in both issued papers, scientific and engineering papers, and issued patents in nanotechnology and artificial intelligence. With multi-billion dollar tech companies thriving under government initiatives and ambitions, China plans to lead the world further in digital, robotic, and artificial intelligence technologies in less than a decade. And of course, all of this is not harmful by default. However, it is a double-edged sword, as these tech companies are recruited by the Chinese authorities to persecute minorities under a frequently stifling authoritarian regime. Unfortunately, we have been blind or have chosen to look away from this enormous responsibility that lies ahead. In the deadly collaborations, partnerships, and funding from Chinese research institutions and tech companies that participate in effect in the violation of human dignity and integrity. And we don't actually need to look far to look for those benign yet costly collaborations. Within a two mile radius of this very room, we have BGI US headquarters, which in 2017 launched a genetic testing center in Xinjiang to collect DNA data from Uyghurs, mostly from those in camps, let alone from consenting individuals. We have Thermo Fisher, a company that just recently stopped selling their genetic testing equipment in Xinjiang for massive illegal collection of Uyghur genetic data that can be used for illegal organ harvesting and targeted persecutions of Uyghur dissidents. We even have our own institutions, MIT CSAIL, forming a five-year research collaboration with iFlyTech, which according to Human Rights Watch, has enforced intrusive collection of biometric data from adults and children in Xinjiang, and used AI-enabled recognition technologies to establish big data platforms that are explicitly used by the police to target ethnic minorities and those with psychosocial disabilities. 
This past February, MIT rushed into another research partnership with Chinese AI giant and global facial recognition leader, Sense Time, which has a joint venture with Leon Technologies facilitating government infrastructure in Xinjiang for surveillance. Partly because of ignorance, and partly because higher education in technology teaches ethics only incidentally, and engages human rights impacts of technology even more superficially, if at all. In costly ways, we, as students, researchers, technologists, and entrepreneurs, are passively participating as Chinese authorities build a 21st century police state in Xinjiang. And these technologies include facial recognition, phone surveillance, DNA sequencing, and biometrics verification. All of it done with our help. Knowing how we have failed as institutions and individuals to overlook our potential impact on a people more than 7,000 miles away may feel disheartening. However, no, recognizing this responsibility gives us the power to change our response. Loving and supporting our academic institutions require much more than sharing praises and avoiding uncomfortable truth. Sometimes we need disruptions to question the status quo by standing up for what is right, and that is exactly why I am standing before you today, because I believe in our ability to bring about change. Individually, do we become overwhelmed with tragedy? Or do we use our positions as researchers, academics, activists, journalists, or politicians to think critically and ethically before we engage with Chinese authorities and companies? Institutionally, do we, do we avoid accusations? Or do we educate the current and future engineers, technologists, and leaders in the world to confront China's abuse of digital, cyber, and biological technologies? Do we merely inform ourselves of what is happening? Or do we begin to share these stories and call US representatives in protecting human dignity and technological tyranny? preventing technological tyranny. Now, MIT and Harvard share a long history of standing up for truth and justice through understanding. We are all connected as one people. The Uyghurs want what you and I all seek deep within, a, a way to live life with meaning, the dignity to live life with meaning. The Uyghurs are a part of me, but also a part of all of us. As collective humanity, we have been tested by the current and past wars. We have been tried by the bigotry and politics. But in the words of John F. Kennedy, we have also been unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoings of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today, at home, and around the world. Therefore, I invite you to listen with an open mind to all of our six speakers here today and begin to understand and reconsider the decisions we make in academia. Because when we care, we learn. And as the conflict resolution specialist, Dr. Donna Hicks once said, once we learn, we no longer can use ignorance as an excuse. Thank you. With that, I'm excited to introduce our three speakers for the morning session. 
whose bios are actually all included in the handout that you received, so feel free to refer to them. First, we will hear from Professor Sean Roberts. Besides the fact that his work is widely known with the Uyghur community, personally, he gave me the hope for this conference by being the first person to respond within 30 minutes of me sending out the invitation emails. And I remember screaming yes in my dorm room when I saw that. Next, we will hear from Dr. Darren Byler, <coughs> whom I first encountered digitally through his articles, then through his talk at Duke University, which started a lot of positive fervor within the Uyghur community. Then we will hear from Professor Ryan Thum, whose US congressional testimony of the crisis left the senators with deep reflections and jolting of the heart. Without further delay, please welcome to the stage Professor Sean Roberts. Thank you very much. I'd, I'd like to thank the organizers, and uh, it's a hard act to follow Zuli's very inspirational uh, introduction to this program today. I'm going to speak about um, how we got to this point. Uh, and I think one of the important things to remember is something this uh, extensive and extreme uh, isn't due to one single thing. I think that there's been a perfect storm of different things that um, come together around what's happening uh, in the Uyghur region of China. Uh, first of all, th there is a long, uh, a long standing conflict between Uyghurs and modern Chinese states, which I'm going to talk a little bit more about. And I think that, you know, that is something that's been going on for a long time and uh, certainly feeds into what's happening now. Um, I think it's, it, we have to note that uh, Xi Jinping's style of rule is also plays a major part in what's happening. And certainly many people have pointed out at uh, meetings like this that uh, we see a lot of things happening in the Uyghur region that then are also being rolled out elsewhere in China. I think it's, it is important to note the role of the Belt and Road Initiative, this region um, where the Uyghurs live and view as their homeland, is a, a critical strategic location for the Belt and Road. And I think for quite some time, the Chinese government has viewed the Uyghurs as uh, kind of a, a barrier to the realization of uh, making that region into a, a transport hub. But the thing I'm going to mo uh, speak most about today is the role of the war on terror in uh, basically facilitating a discourse uh, that with time has targeted Uyghurs uh, by their identity as potential terrorists. So first, I'll talk about the long-standing conflict between Uyghurs and modern Chinese states. I like to call this uh, the conflict between Eastern Turkestan and Xinjiang. Uh, Xinjiang uh, is the name that is used by the, the Chinese government. Uh, many Uyghurs uh, dislike using the name. Um, it it uh, translates as new territory or new border, and it belies kind of the more recent connection of this region to modern China. Um, and I think this highlights the fact that many Uyghurs uh, deny this name. Uh, one name that's often used is East Turkestan, uh, which has is, which is subsequently been identified by the Chinese state as essentially um, a terrorist organization, just using the, the name East Turkestan is assumed to be an act of extremism. But this gets at the core, I think, of what uh, the conflict between Uyghurs and modern Chinese states uh, is about. And it's about an issue of self-determination in territory. That does not necessarily mean separatism and sovereignty. I think that there's lots of ways we see self-determination uh, in the world today, uh, aside from separate nation states. Um, Uyghurs generally view this region as their homeland. They see themselves as the indigenous population of this region, along with other uh, Turkic um, nationalities that live in the region. Um, and they also, uh, I think, generally 
Uyghurs who think about this look at it as having been um, conquered by the Qing dynasty in the 18th century and um, subsequently occupied by modern Chinese states. Now, um, you, can, you can look at that critically through a historical lens, but I think what's most important that that's the general understanding of this region that Uyghurs have. And the Chinese state has a diametrically opposed uh, vision of this region as always being part of China, a greater China, and uh, believing that the Uyghurs are not indigenous to this region. In fact, I think what's really striking about this is in a recent counterterrorism policy paper of the Chinese government, uh, about a page and a half, it begins with a, with a page and a half making this point, that this is a region that's always been part of China and the Uyghurs are not indigenous to it. So what does that have to do with terrorism? Um, I'm not sure, but it shows you how important that narrative is to the Chinese state. And I think that what, we, what we're seeing uh, in the conflict between Uyghurs and modern Chinese states is that it's a, po it's, it's a situation where there has been uh, a colonization and that has not been recognized and has not progressed to a post-colonial situation. The Chinese state has probably only twice, the modern Chinese state has only twice in its history kind of rolled out accommodating policies that recognize the Uyghurs' attachment to this territory. And they were very brief, right after the revolution and right after the, the um, cultural revolution. So I think this, this has been a, a long-standing conflict, but it changed significantly after September 11th, 2001. And um, that was, of course, when we were all introduced to the narrative of global terrorism, uh, which has, has taken on a life of itself, I would say, in the world. And six weeks after 9-11, the Chinese government released a policy paper claiming that we, all Uyghur descent inside China, inside the People's Republic of China, uh, and all violent instances that had happened in this territory throughout the 1990s had been perpetrated by a large international network of Uyghur terrorists funded by Osama bin Laden. And it included a variety of organizations abroad um, most of which were human rights organizations, um, kind of political rights organizations. And uh, I, it was mostly dismissed by, I think, the, the Western audience, in particular um, people who were studying this region and, and the Uyghur people. However, a, a year later, both the US and the UN recognized one of the organizations outlined in this paper, an organization called the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, as being a terrorist organization. And I think that was the beginning of a process that we we're seeing kind of the, the fruits of now. And we saw, uh, in addition to the Chinese government being able to use this narrative of terrorism to justify its approach to Uyghur descent, um, it also led to a proliferation of literature in the West that uh, basically took Chinese claims at face value. And this continues in security studies and terrorism studies to this day. Uh, and, the, and the idea is that this ETIM group that presumably in the early 1990s was already involved in lots of terrorism and, and funded by Osama bin Laden had continued to do uh, exactly that into the present. Now, I'm gonna try to briefly give you some facts about this uh, from my own research. So uh, the Eastern Turkestan Islamic Movement, which uh, the people who were associated with this, if we can call it an organization at all, um, never used that term, uh, was a group that seemed to be established in about 1998 in Afghanistan and existed till 2003. And this, this person, uh, Hassan Masoom, was uh, its original organizer. And essentially, um, it was a group that was trying to establish uh, a, an insurgency within China, uh, a liberation movement among Uyghurs. Um, as unrealistic as that was at that time, and certainly would be at this time, um, they were trying to establish training camps and get some Uyghurs over to 
uh, trained to go to war against the Chinese state. Uh, basically, I don't think they ever had any significant resources. They certainly don't seem to have ever received funding from Osama bin Laden or Al Qaeda uh, or, or the Taliban. In fact, they later um, condemned the 9 11 attacks and they were driven into Pakistan in 2002 when the US invaded Afghanistan. And in 2003, Hassan Massoum was killed and basically this organization ceased to exist. Uh, you know, I don't, it's hard to say how many people went through these training camps, but I'm quite confident it was a very small number. Um, and there's no evidence that they were ever able to go back to China and carry out any violence. Um, unfortunately, about two years later, um, an organization, or at least uh, videos, start to appear on the internet. Uh, created by this man, Abdul Haq, who had been involved with Hassan Masoom previously, um, but he seems to have moved into Pakistan and did establish ties with uh, Al-Qaeda. And he creates a lot of different videos over the period from 2008 to 2013, where uh, it's threatening attacks on China, but it basically only shows Abdul Haq, sometimes some stock footage from back in the day with Hassan Masoom. But there's no evidence that this group was ever able to um, carry out any attacks inside China. Um, and it's not clear it ever had very much um, of a Uyghur membership base or Uyghur militants involved with it. Um, and I think this only changed recently. So my, my analysis of this organization was essentially a recruiting tool of Al Qaeda. Probably not a very successful one, but trying to attract Uyghurs leaving China to, um, to Al Qaeda. So the terrorism threat from 2001 to 2013 in this Uyghur region of China, or in China in general, is minimal, uh, if not non-existent. We don't see many attacks that are clearly look like uh, terrorist attacks. We don't see a whole lot of violence, period. Uh, there were threats made towards the Olympics from this Abdul Haq person from the Turkestan Islamic Party, uh, but nothing really ever transpired from that. But fear grew out of this, and I think that, um, not, I think to a certain extent where, where I think the Chinese state initially used this terrorism threat opportunistically, I think some people within the state, and certainly some Han Chinese, began to believe that this was a real threat. And this was further exacerbated in 2009 uh, when there were mass ethnic riots in the city of Urumqi, uh, where basically Uyghurs and Han Chinese went after each other and were killing each other in the streets. Um, this was, this seems to have started around a protest that was put down by security forces, but what we saw was a boiling over of tensions. But after that riot, basically the crackdown was so severe, um, international communications and the internet was completely shut off in this region for a year. Uh, thousands of Uyghurs disappeared. Scores were arrested. We started to see more restrictions on Uyghur mobility, uh, increased surveillance, and we started to see attacks on uh, religion and including certain Uyghur cultural attributes that could be seen as related to religion. Um, so again, the, even though there was no sign that this had anything to do with religion or terrorism or extremism, it became kind of caught up in that same discourse. This, this crackdown was, was very severe and I think was a, a, a turning point uh, where we saw first the beginning of a, of a cycle of violence and repression inside China related to Uyghurs. We saw some violent attacks that um, look more like terrorism. Uh, the details are not uh, very well known, but Every time there would be a violent attack, we would see more repression, and then we would see more violence, and we had this cycle. And at the same time, we had a, a significant number of Uyghurs leaving the region, some going through uh, human trafficking networks through Southeast Asia, 
Some uh, mysteriously in 2015, the government gave out passports to all Uyghurs, and we had a mass migration of people legally just using their passports. And most of these Uyghurs were going to Turkey, which is one place that was known among Uyghurs as uh, a safe haven where they could go and, uh, if not receive official refugee status, at least be able to live peacefully. Um, and Finally, a group of these, hundreds of Uyghurs, potentially a couple thousand, uh, found themselves in Syria. And actually, they were associated with the Turkestan Islamic Party. Um, and basically, this, this migration allowed the Turkestan Islamic Party to finally become um, a fighting force. So I think that this process has led to a general equating of Uyghurs with terrorists in the eyes of the Chinese state. By 2016, the People's Republic of China begins conflating Uyghur identity with terrorism and extremism, seeing the, the Uyghur population as kind of a virus infecting China's harmonious society. In fact, a lot of the rhetoric of state officials um, uses this kind of biological language about the infection of extremism and of the Uyghurs into China's larger population. And for the Chinese government, I think it's begun to see the solution uh, that what has always been really an over-exaggerated terrorist threat uh, as being the transformation, destruction, or quarantine of the Uyghur identity and the Uyghur population. So we. We're going to hear a lot about this, so I'm not going to go into what's happened since 2016. Um, but you know, we, we, we watched this unfold, a lot of us who've been studying the region. We saw all this increased surveillance starting, the DNA sampling, cell phone tracking, facial recognition surveillance. Uh, we saw the creation of police stations every 300 yards in urban areas. And um, by 2017, we started seeing that people were disappearing, and we started learning about these mass internment camps. So I, I would suggest that this is, we're seeing something that's kind of a new form of ethnic cleansing. Ethnic cleansing is generally associated with the Yugoslav Civil War, and um, associated with the idea of, establish, of removing an ethnic group from a territory. But what we're seeing happening in the Uyghur region of China now is more an attempt to cleanse the members of the ethnic group, uh, to somehow change them into different people. I don't think it's an attempt to change them into Chinese, because I don't think, I think the relationship between Uyghurs and the Chinese state is such that uh, Uyghurs are never really accepted as Chinese, but they are seen as um, a dangerous element now, and the idea is to make them somehow into a docile and loyal uh, population. Um, now, I just want to end with a note about how I think the global war on terror has facilitated this situation. I mean, certainly, uh, this is something that the Chinese state is doing. But I think the global war on terror has allowed it to do it. And I think it has, in some ways, even encouraged uh, the Chinese state to do what it's doing in the Uyghur region. First of all, the fact that there is no internationally recognized definition of terrorism is extremely troubling, that we've been fighting a global war for 18 years against an enemy that we can't define. Um, and this has allowed, I think, throughout the world, a lot of more repressive authoritarian states to attack domestic um, opposition, and, and this happens also in democratic states, uh, in, in domestic opponents that have legitimate grievances, and to basically label them as terrorists. Uh, and I think this has a couple very troubling um, results. First, it can turn a group that hasn't really been militant into a more militant group. It can kind of isolate them to the point where they see no other option. And secondly, and I think most troubling uh, and most relevant to what we're talking about today, the terrorism label uh, essentially dehumanizes um, the people that are tagged with it. And at the same time, it very much becomes uh, associated with their thought process. Uh, partic particularly the conflation of terrorism with extremism means that 
extremism is not just something you do, it's something you think. And so that is very easily conflated with one, Islam. And we're seeing that around the world where people are saying, well, the real problem is Islam that's leading to uh, terrorism. And in, I think, the case of the Uyghurs, it can be conflated with their identity and their culture. And so uh, I think in that context, we can see that the global war on terror essentially lends itself to genocidal type strategies. And I think that's part of what we're seeing in China today. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's a real honor to be here. Uh, I'm going to pick up on what Sean was talking about and turn now to talk in, to some extent about the economics that are driving some of this and also the role of technology and how it emerged over time. I'm going to talk about what I call a Chinese security industrial complex, or in some of my writing, I call it terror capitalism. So to get started thinking about this, we need to think about the 1990s, which is when China was really opening up to the West when industrialization was really taking off in the eastern part of the country. That's when all the stuff that says made in China first began to arrive in Walmart here in the US. Um, and to get access and to produce that, that, those new forms of uh, production in industry, they needed resources. And so one of the things that they needed was oil and natural gas. Um, and that's when we saw people moving west, moving to Xinjiang for economic opportunities to work in resource extraction. Because Xinjiang, the Uyghur homeland, is home to a large percentage of Chinese oil and natural gas and also coal. It's now become a source for industrial agriculture, cotton and tomatoes in particular. And so when those folks from eastern China moved out to Xinjiang, they began to build out the hard infrastructure of the region. Um, and that, that looks like pipelines and roads um, and all the service industries that are around those things so they can get access to the natural resources. And that really brought people into the Uyghur homeland to a larger extent. Prior to this, there had been a, a Han presence in the region, but they had lived primarily in the northern part of the province or the, the region. Um, as the infrastructure build out began, they started moving right into the heartland of the Uyghur population. Um, and there was a number of effects from this. Uh, this was an Open Up the West campaign that was sponsoring a lot of this. It was a Chinese state initiative. Um, and they wanted to integrate the Uyghur population with the country. That was part of the goal. But actually what happened through this build out was Uyghurs saw themselves being dispossessed of their land um, because in many cases land was actually taken from them. Um, but in a more general sense, the economy began to shift and Uyghurs were excluded from that new economy because all of these natural resource extraction industries centered only around Han labor. Uh, Uyghurs were almost exclusively excluded from those, from those industries. Uh, they just weren't given those jobs. Um, and so the economy began to shift. Things became more expensive. Rents increased. Uh, basic staples became more expensive. And Uyghurs saw themselves becoming poorer. Even as they were making the same amount of money, uh, the economy was shifting around them. And so they, they saw themselves in a more desperate situation. Of course, there are some benefits to having infrastructure. There's roads, and there's also communications infrastructure. And so by 2010, soon after those large-scale uh, protests in Urumqi that Sean was just talking about, 3G networks were built out across the, the region. Um, and so for the first time, Uyghurs in the rural areas, which is the majority of Uyghurs, uh, had access to 3G networks and very soon smartphones. Um, and so when I went for a first, my first year of field work as an anthropologist, I was learning languages in 2011, people were just starting to buy these smartphones, especially young people. Um, and they're starting to use them in their, in their homes uh, across the region. By 2011, or uh, 2012, the, an app called WeChat, which is a social media app that allows people to speak using oral communication, came online as well. And that was really transformative for Uyghurs. As prior to this, uh, it was difficult for Uyghurs to type on a smartphone. The, the, the capability wasn't there for their language. And also, many Uyghurs are, are not fully, uh, they prefer to speak rather than to type. Uh, some of it has to do with their education. Um, and they found very quickly, as use, using this, we, this app, that they could communicate with each other fairly freely, because the state also didn't have the capability of, of regulating oral speech. Uh, so they were able to speak in Uyghur, and the state wasn't quite keeping up with what they were saying. And so they were talking about a lot of things. They were talking about culture. They were talking about politics. 
This was the time of the Arab Spring, so they were interested in some of those issues. They were interested in Turkish movies, Iranian movies, all kinds of movies from around the world, um, which is something I was studying at the time. Um, but they were also interested in religion. So they were, they were downloading messages from teachers based in parts of Xinjiang, but also based in Turkey and Uzbekistan. Mostly conversations, they were, they were interesting conversations about what does it mean to be Muslim? A kind of very normal kind of Muslim stuff, like what's halal, what's haram? Um, what does it mean to be a contemporary person in the world today? Um, and so people began to get uh, to adapt their lifestyle in certain ways and became more pious in their appearance as Muslims. Um, so WeChat enabled a couple things. It, it began to change religious perspectives and, and practice, uh, but it also gave people ideas about the city and about being a global citizen. And so during this time, we saw lots of people moving from rural areas to regional centers and then from there to the city, especially young men who were incentivized by their families or asked by their families to go to the city and, and try to find a job. Um, they came for a number of reasons to find jobs was one of them, but the other reason was religious practice because in the city, they were able to practice their faith more freely. Uh, there's more anonymity in the city, so that meant that they could go to the mosque more regularly, they could dress how they wanted to dress. Um, the, in the countryside, in the rural area, people were watched more closely. The mosque space were full. So in 2014, when I did a second year of field work, this is what Friday prayers looked like. There was, there was so many people that they couldn't sit, fit inside the mosque. That The mosque was also seen as not the location of real Islam. It was the center of ritual practice, uh, but the Islamic practice itself happened around the mosque in prayer room spaces and on people's phones. Uh, people were passing messages using SD cards, using Bluetooth technology. Uh, they would sit and discuss messages. Um, they would share things. They built like, online personas as a WeChat uh, uh, user. Um, and internet became a really important part of people's everyday life. So many young men that I interviewed told me that putting money on their their phone card was an important part of their week. If they couldn't put money on the card, they couldn't contact their family back in the countryside. They also couldn't find jobs, and they also couldn't perform their religiosity. So the state was paying attention to this. They, they began to realize that people are using WeChat to do stuff that they thought was crossing the line. Um, and so they were trying to find ways to assess and regulate it. Um, and they were also concerned with the, the kind of trend in violence that was happening in spaces around the, the Uyghur homeland, but also in other parts of China. There was an attack in Kunming and another one in, in Beijing that very, really alarmed people, especially in other parts of China. Um, and the discourse of terrorism really picked up. Um, we, uh, officials I interviewed at this time told me that like, they were seeing among Uyghurs a Talibanization of the Uyghurs. Um, as Uyghurs, they thought, were becoming extremists. So in 2014, they declared the People's War on Terror, and that looked like this. Uh, it was posters that were placed in every uh, alleyway in the, in the Uyghur neighborhoods, um, saying that oh, you're no longer permitted to dress in these manners. Women were no longer allowed to veil themselves. Young men no longer allowed to have beards and Islamic symbols were now forbidden. Instead, it's, this poster says you should look like a normal person, um, a beautiful person. Um, and so pious expressions of Islam were now officially outlawed. Um, and there was also new mechanisms put in place to put people, to expel people from the city um, and, and begin this re-education process. It picked up much, uh, two years later to a much larger extent. So what does this look like? And here I'm building a little bit on what Sean was talking about. The People's War on Terror is one in which the people are involved. Everyone's invested. If you see something, say something. It's that sort of thinking. Um, but it's also fought in a different register. So it's, it's not about occupying and bombing another country, as the US has done in Iraq and Afghanistan. Instead, it's about targeting a, a population, a native population that's in their own country, um, domestic populations of people, citizens. Um, it's minority Muslim people that look different, that are Turkic, that speak a different language. Um, and so in that sense, it's different than the US model of, of war on terror. Um, it also uses different technologies in different ways. It's using cameras, checkpoints, prisons, internment camps, and forced labor. Um, so it's less about overt violence, but it's more of a, a long, slow, deep violence. This 
is funded and operationalized by technology, but also state security and higher education. That's why it's a security complex. Um, these people are working together to build this new industry around controlling and re-educating the population. The goal is to break the autonomy of the Uyghur internet, WeChat, um, and also control their movement. There's now 1,400 tech firms that are working explicitly on this in Xinjiang. That's a, a growth from oh, just over the last decade. Um, and in the last two years, $7.2 billion have been invested in this industry. Um, a couple of the examples that, you can, that I can point out uh, that have been produced by this industry is a, a technology from a company called Mia Pico that does AI-enabled auto transcription and translation of Uyghur spoken audio. So you can see that that's a technology that's meant to assess WeChat oral speech. Um, there's also new programs put in place uh, to do the auto detection of Uyghur faces to operationalize ethnic, ethno-racial profiling um, as an explicit goal of an AI uh, system. If you go to, this, go to this region, as I did most recently in April of last year, this is the sort of thing you'll first notice, is the convenience police stations that are every 300 meters on every city block. Um, these are really checkpoint-oriented uh, facilities and also rapid response units, uh, but mostly it's about cameras that are based at these, in each of these stations and also the sort of random checkpoints that are, are facilitated by them. People coming out of the checkpoint, uh, out of the, the station, and then conducting a checkpoint spot checks that are also racially profiling, uh, where it's basically looking for Uyghurs, young Uyghurs that are, look like they're rural, they don't look like they're from the city, that are potentially suspect. As you move through the space, you'll also find many checkpoints between jurisdictions. So as you move uh, out of a city, across the county line, um, sometimes it, it, it's more uh, dense than that, just going into a shopping mall or any sort of institution, there'll be a face recognition enabled checkpoint, which is, functions as a hard reset of the, of, of the system because as you move through that system, they have a very clear idea of where that person is in the world. Um, and it's, it's only really looking for Uyghurs or Turkic minorities. Because most of these checkpoints have a green lane associated with them where no one, people are not assessed at all. So this checkpoint, which I went through in April, um, there's a, on the, the left side of the checkpoint is a, the back gate of the checkpoint, which is opened by a police officer for people based on their, the appearance of their face. Um, it, they just simply look at the person and say, you can come through this way. Um, I wasn't sure which lane to go through because I'm not Uyghur or Han, so I asked the Uyghurs that I was in line with uh, in Uyghur, like which lane I should go, to, go through, and they said, well, you're speaking Uyghur, you could possibly be a city Uyghur, so you should go through the, go through the Uyghur line. So I, I went through the Uyghur line, but I had a passport, so I wasn't, uh, they had to assess me differently because I, I don't have a national ID. Um, because the way the system works is you scan your ID and then it matches the picture on your ID to your face. All of this infrastructure, hard infrastructure, is supported by data that's been collected um, in a sort of unprecedented manner. Um, in 2016-17, there was a program put in place that was framed as a, as a public health initiative called Physicals for All. And this required Uyghurs um, and others in the province, but Uyghurs in particular, to go to their local police station and submit biometric data. So it was a police officer that was collecting this data. So it's, the public health aspect of it was, I think, lost in most cases. It instead was people giving DNA, blood, and fingerprints, um, but also speaking into a device to get a voice signature, unique voice signature for each person. Uh, they had to read the same thing several times um, until it was uh, sufficiently recognized. And then they also had their face scanned from a variety of different angles. Um, with different people doing different expressions. Uh, people talk about this as a long process that took, in, in some cases, an hour to get a full scan of the person's face, um, which tells us something about the resolution and the fidelity of those images that are being collected. Um, and when 36 million people do that, you have a, a database that's really unprecedented in terms of scale and fidelity and resolution. Um, 36 million is more than the population of the region, so that is telling us either there's the official population of the region is not, as, is not what it is, or people had to go and do it more than once um, to, to, to fully uh, meet the, the requirements of the system. 
Um, this is a coercive process. People had to go to the police station. There was no possibility not to go to the police station and submit your data. This data was then uh, put into a, a system that we're not fully sure is a, to what extent it's operationalized, although I have some sense that it is working, called an integrated joint operations platform. There's more research that needs to be done on this, this platform in terms of who's servicing it. Um, we know certain companies that are involved in parts of it. Um, but together, it's a regional database that's collecting all of this data and putting it in a single space. Um, getting data from, in addition to the biometric stuff that's been collected, uh, CCTV cameras, Wi-Fi sniffers, getting packets of information as it moves through space, um, looking through health, health uh, records, banking records, family planning history, and of course, all of those checkpoints. It's also supported uh, by a nanny app that people have been asked to install on their phones. Um, in Urumqi, at least, they're using uh, an app called Jingwang Weishu, which is a clean net guard. That's one of the ways you could translate it. In other spaces, it's a different app. But in general, people have this app on their phone. When I was there in April, I was observing many people having this app checked on their phone uh, at many checkpoints. Um, by my research focus at that time was really going through checkpoints and, and doing observations of how people were interacting with police. Um, this app, as we understand it, works to uh, first certify who is using the phone. It's matched to the person's ID. And then it searches through all messaging coming from that phone to find unique identifiers of your social network. So it's looking at all messaging uh, from both video and audio to text and, and uh, any other things that's, that's coming out of your phone, photos. Um, so Together, all of that stuff is then compared to an external database for any kind of flag materials to kind of figure out who you're connected with. Um, users uh, that have flag material on their phone are supposed to delete it immediately. Um, they can also be called in uh, uh, to the police station if they don't. So in addition to all of this quantitative kind of data that's using tech, there's also a qualitative aspect to it where um, people were asked to go into um, Uyghur homes and also Kazakh homes, police officers, but also uh, what they call relatives or civil servants that are sent to, to monitor and assess Uyghurs. Um, and in general, they use 10 categories to do these assessments. People started out with 100 points, and you're a, considered a safe person. Um, and then through this assessment, you're determined to be safe, unsafe, normal, or unsafe. Um, so you start with 100 points, and in each of these categories count as minus 10. Um, so if you're of military age, minus 10. If you're Uyghur, minus 10. If you're unemployed, minus 10, uh, which are sort of categories of existence that counted for many, many people. So already, most people are just in the normal category. Um, then if you traveled abroad, uh, you have a passport, uh, gone to one of 26 banned countries or Muslim-majority countries, if you've overstayed a visa, um, or have a family member living abroad, those are all categories that count against you. Um, then there's three important categories that are focused on religion. Uh, so if you pray regularly, minus 10. Um, and if you have religious knowledge, which means like you pass messages on WeChat, uh, if you learned uh, Arabic or studied the Quran, those are all things that will count against you. And, and those are the things that, count, that caught many, many people uh, because they're actually using technology to assess these things, not just people saying, no, I don't have religious knowledge. Um, there are also a, a category about uh, family life. Uh, teaching your children about Islam in your home is also forbidden. So talking to people that have been in this system and gone through these assessments, um, this is Gulbahar Jalilova, who we saw a, a short video from at the beginning of this conference. She said that in her cell, uh, there was really two categories of people. Uh, the people of her age, which is the older generation, were often taken to the cell because they had their phone number in someone else's phone. Um, someone else had been uh, detained, and then they went through that person's phone and saw the, all the contacts, and then those people were also detained. So that's one way that technology is used in kind of a, uh, a really direct way. Um, but there's also uh, digital footprint searches that are also pulling people into the system. She said that the younger generation of people that were in the, in the cell with her um, had things on their phone that they had deleted a long time ago, or at least some of them said that. Um, this one girl told her, I, de I deleted them a long time ago, but somehow they restored them. They were just pictures of women in veils. And one of them, a little girl, is holding her hands up in prayer. 
Um, and so that's enough to kind of signify to the police or the people doing assessments that this is an extremist that is, uh, is suspicious and, and needs to be detained for further assessment. Once you're determined to be unsafe, uh, you're sent to a camp, which is something that Ryan's going to talk about uh, in his talk, uh, where you're scheduled for re-education. Um, there's camps all over the, the province or region. Um, most of them function as uh, kind of medium security prisons, where people are held in, in uh, dormitories under lock, locked, uh, in locked cells with armed guards. Um, but there is a re-education aspect to it. Some people are learning Chinese, uh, if their Chinese is bad, most people doing that, um, but also learning political thought um, and going through sort of forced confessions, struggle sessions. Uh, so that's what we see possibly here, although it's really hard to source these images and know exactly what's going on. Uh, but we've heard from some reports that people have to stand and denounce their past crimes, studying the Quran or, or what have you, and then others are meant to criticize them. And through this process, you gain points towards eventual release or movement into a, a minimum security space in the camp. Those that successfully graduate are, graduate are put into uh, forced internships, uh, at least some of them, close to the camp. So this is an image that's showing you prison-like areas and then recently built, just over the last six months, factory-type spaces um, just to the north of it, the, the red area, the, the buildings with red roofs. Um, people in those spaces are often learning how to do textile work. Um, maybe they already knew, I don't know. Um, the people that so far that have been moved into these spaces are people that are actually quite well educated because the, they can speak Chinese fluently. Um, and they know how to navigate the political uh, system, and they, they can speak uh, and take tests well. Um, and so it's not clear that these people are actually getting much benefit from uh, the training at the sewing machine. Um, so just to begin to wrap up, um, what's been produced through the system kind of throughout it, both in the camps and outside of the camps, is a new division of power. Um, power in terms of personal autonomy, but also collective autonomy. Um, so one person I interviewed told me that Uyghurs are alive, but our entire lives are now spent behind walls. It's like we are ghosts living in another world. Um, a Han relative, someone who was sent to assess people in, in their homes, told me, I feel so much more freedom, so much freedom now. Uh, we can go anywhere we want. And so from his perspective, this was a monumental success. Um, it was uh, something that had produced real change um, and really, he felt empowering for himself. The mosque spaces that were overflowing when I began my field work um, and through the midpoint of my field work are now completely empty. They're still open, but there's checkpoints at the front of them, and so no one is entering the mosques. Uh, tech employees that work in this space talk about uh, how what they're building has unlimited market potential because the Belt and Road Initiative encompasses 60% of the world's Muslim population. They said there's all kinds of applications where this population management tools can be put in place. Um, there's many tech firms involved in this. Most of the leading AI companies in China are involved in this. This is sort of the testing ground to build out and, and experiment with their technology. Um, China wants to invest 150 billion in AI. By 2030, they want to be a, a world power when it comes to tech. Um, and so they're putting a lot of money behind this. Um, these companies are, are integrated with the West. Some of them have partnerships with institutions here like MIT. Um, it's also not simply Chinese investment money going into this, state investment. There's also foreign investment that's supporting some of these tech firms as well. Um, so Fidelity International, Qualcomm Ventures, Sequoia, and Cinovation have all put money into these tech companies. So, to finally conclude, um, from Uyghur perspectives, what's being produced by this is open air prisons. Um, so both in the camp themselves, but also outside of the camp, all, all movement is monitored, all kind of thought is monitored when it comes to digital communication. And so people feel themselves changing their human behavior. Um, it's also producing what Uyghurs see as a weakening of basic institutions, their faith, language, family, and and cuisine, those kind of basic things that are still parts of who they are as native people to this space. From the state perspective, what's being produced is long-term security. 
uh, long-term st stability. Um, they also see unlimited industrial growth outside of China and in China, but throughout kind of the global south. Those are kind of the target spaces where they want to go next with this technology. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. Um, and and uh, thank you to Zuli and the whole team for organizing this really impressive event. Um, as we've already seen from the other presentations, the, um, the history of the construction of what really looks like an ethno-totalitarian state in Xinjiang um, is deeper than just the last couple of years. Um, and I, I would throw out one, one example of that, um, it, uh, just to give you a, a, another sense of that. Already, as early as 2010 or 2011, a lot of Uyghurs were required to have something called a, a people's convenience card, or what they colloquially call the green card, in order to get permission which required them to get permission to move from one city to another. And by 2015, that was pretty much widespread. So this is a, we should have already been, the alarm bells should have already been you know, ringing for the rest of the world that something um, uh, uh, sort of uniquely uh, awful was unfolding. But what really caught the world's attention was the building of mass internment camps and the imprisonment of an estimated high hundreds of thousands up to two million people in those camps. And what I want to do is just step back a little bit and talk about, um, focus on that and talk about the evidence base. And you'll get some more of the evidence base from other speakers uh, later in terms of um, testimonies from people and the satellite images. So I will focus on the evidence that comes from the mouth of the Chinese state itself, um, because there is, there is a lot of it, and enough to make, the, um, uh, to make this un, undeniable. So uh, the basic claim I want to talk about is the, uh, well, let me just introduce these, uh, a little bit about these, these camps. Um, these are, the people who are put in these are put in them without any criminal charges. Um, without any trial, you know, they never come before a judge, they don't have a lawyer, there is no appeal. Um, and in many, perhaps most cases, there is no notification of, of uh, family members. People simply, simply disappear. The, the, I think the, in some ways, in terms of the world gaining recognition, uh, gaining awareness of what was going on, um, the most important evidence uh, may have been the system by which the Chinese state uh, uh, um, advertised for contractors to build these camps. A German scholar named Adrian Zenz recognized that the Chinese state was advertising uh, bids openly online uh, for, for uh, construction companies to compete to build these, these camps. And he harvested about 50 something of these notices uh, and used that to, to produce the first really thorough d study of, of the camp system, uh, which came, this study came out in about uh, 2018, in March, was it? April 2018? Um, a lot of the journalism and reporting that's followed has been based ultimately on uh, this kind of evidence. And uh, it struck me that, that these bids have not actually been shown to the public very much. So I, I wanted to show one uh, to you. Most of these have now been scrubbed from the internet by the authorities because they realize how, um, how damning they are. But we have um, screenshots of them, and some of them have been preserved on uh, the Internet Archive's Wayback Machine. So here's a typical example um, uh, calling for the construction of a so-called legal system education transformation school in the town of uh, Marabashi, which is Bachu in, uh, in Chinese. You can see some of the information is blacked out. You have to be like a registered um, uh, participant in the system to see it, but a lot of it is, is, is open to the public. For example, you can see that uh, it is the um, United Front Work Department that is calling for this construction. 
Uh, and if you scroll down on a lot of these, you can get some details of what kind of equipment any um, bidder will have to provide if they're going to build these uh, camps. So for example, this one has a lot of um, a very specialized uh, uh, security terminology on different forms of uh, fence, which I've somewhat, fencing and, and bars and things, which I've somewhat crudely translated here. Um, so this is, a, this is a major kind of evidence that um, journalists then followed up uh, on and um, created even larger investigations. Here's a really important uh, piece of journalism that I think has not been paid enough attention to by AFP uh, that looked at over 1,000 uh, documents from the state that they found online, uh, which, which, cat which uh, catalogs a lot of the, the kinds of equipment that these um, so-called training schools uh, have, electric cattle prods, spiked clubs, stun guns, uh, razor wire. Another interesting thing you can see from these documents is the changing of the names for, uh, for these institutions over time. And they're kind of, it's kind of a modular naming system. They start out, um, I've just given you a representative sample, they start out talking about eliminating extremism, um, then they go for a little while, you get uh, this legal system thing which is sprinkled throughout. Um, most common uniting factor is the idea of uh, education and transformation, um, which you see over uh, the, the course of the uh, two and a half years. Um, and then ultimately settling on where, what they call them today, which is a vocational skills education training center. But the mixing and matching of these different modular, modular units makes it clear that these are basically the same kind of institution with the names uh, changing. Uh, over time. I also want to point out the range of dates here. One of the things that's striking about this uh, program of internment camp construction is how incredibly fast it has uh, unfolded. We get our first calls for the construction of these new uh, buildings around uh, the summer of 2016, and uh, meaning that basically this if we just take the sort of middle ground estimate of the number of people of a million, which is like 10% of the Uyghur um, population, uh, it means that, that these facilities to house a million people have been built in the short space of only two years. You know, while I'm at it, I would also like to point out that um, this, this uh, disappearance of about a million people is on top of a pre-existing mass incarceration problem. So even before this mass internment program was rolled out, uh, this, the, Xinjiang had a problem very similar to the mass incarceration of African Americans in the US, whereby Uyghurs were disproportionately targeted in uh, sentencing and in arrests, um, disproportionately poorly represented in court, not that there are very many acquittals in the Chinese justice system. Um, but there, so there was already an enormous number of Uyghurs, uh, particularly Uyghur men, in the Chinese prison system. This is outside of that. This is an extra legal system that just added an additional 10% of the Uyghur population um, in those two years. OK, another um, fascinating source of evidence that we get from the Chinese state itself is its propaganda. And if, you're, if you, like most people, have sort of come recently to this story, you're probably uh, most likely to be familiar with the propaganda that sells these camps as um, benign uh, skills training centers. And the state has produced several videos that are um, filmed in staged camps. They take real camps, and then they make some alterations to them. Um, for example, one that you can see on satellite photos is that they add um, fake sports uh, uh, courts in the, in the yards outside or paint like a, a symbol of a sports team on the pavement. Um, here you can see a, a, a still from one of those videos. And one of the things that's different here is the kind of people that they've put in for this uh, uh, staged video. That You can see that it's mixed gender. It's younger people. And this, I think, is probably aimed at making this look more like what we would think of as a school, um, when, in fact, other images we have from inside, which I'll show you from 
in a moment, are all um, uh, uh, segregated by gender, and they tend to include a lot more people in their um, uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. Another thing that we see that's different here from what we otherwise know about the camps is that um, we know that many of these um, uh, internment and indoctrination camps have a, a set of bars or wires that separate the teacher um, from the students. So these actually is, this has been a very effective propaganda move by the state because since there is a, a dearth of images for the Western media to use when they want to illustrate their stories, they've often taken these stills from these uh, propaganda videos and said, image from a camp. Well, it's not really an image from a camp. It's an image from a, a, a, a staged version of the camp. Uh, nonetheless, this propaganda drive has given us um, some actual data that might be, well, it's not reliable, but it, it, it certainly has, has gestured to things that, that turned out to be um, uh, true from reports from inside. For example, this was really the first, the first way that we got a sense that there was a, a, a large forced labor component um, to the internment uh, system. This is an image from a tour that was just given to journalists uh, a couple of days ago. But this wasn't always the way the state wanted to represent these uh, centers. And you've probably seen this image. Uh, this comes from, uh, this comes from uh, officials in Xinjiang from a period in which there was a lot more interest in showing local audience and showing audiences of other officials that we, the state, are taking care of these dangerous um, and backwards Uyghurs. And so you see a lot more emphasis in the imagery that was coming out around 2017 on the fences, on the huge number of police uh, guards, on orderly rows, um, on uniforms, um, this, uh, this kind of thing. And if I, if I have time at the end of this, which I'm not sure I will because I forgot, and I won't know if I will because I forgot to start my clock, but... Um, if I have time, I'll, I'll show you where you can access the original um, uh, government post of this, um, of this image. We also have uh, the changing story of the Chinese state. As, uh, as Zuli mentioned, they, there was an earlier set of so soft denials. We're not sure about this. We can't confirm that these exist. Or maybe a few times they said they don't exist to foreign audiences. And then uh, that transitioned into, well, these are actually benevolent um, education, uh, skills training uh, centers. Um, at first, they implied that they were not voluntarily voluntary, but then they had a new propaganda that said, have all these uh, people in these uh, staged camps saying, we're here voluntarily. Well, recently, I think it was uh, about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, uh, they came out, uh, the state came out with a new white paper that actually listed what they say are the reasons for people going into the camps. And they say the people in the camps are those who participated in terrorist or extremist activities in circumstances that were not serious enough to constitute a crime. What kind of terrorist or extremist activity is not serious enough to um, constitute a crime? That may seem on its face to be... Um, uh, kind of ridiculous. It's more ridiculous if you look at the Chinese terrorism law, which includes things like engaging in thought that supports extremism. So even the things you think can be a crime under Chinese terrorist law, but these are the folks who don't even rise to that level. These are things that for, for which you can. And also, um, re really uh, heartbreakingly, uh, number three is people who've already served out prison senses, sentences, um, who are arbitrarily deemed to need further, um, uh, further internment. One last kind of evidence I want to talk about that comes from the mouth of representatives of the state is um, the, uh, um, the responses that police officers in the region have given to journalists who cold call their stations. A lot of this has been done by uh, Radio Free Asia, which has um, a really um, powerful group of Uyghur-speaking uh, reporters. But it's also been done by other, uh, other journalistic outfits. And one of the really striking things that has come out of what police say is uh, an expression of, of concern from police officers about not being able to meet quotas that they've been given. 
Um, we have reports of quotas of 20%. The highest one uh, that police have reported was 40%, somewhere in uh, uh, Karakash. Um, and in this environment where the police feel like it's very difficult to find, to choose who will go into the internment camps, they've had to resort to some um, pretty fine-grained uh, uh, analysis of people's behavior. Um, and some of the things that either the police have given or relatives who have been told by police um, were the reasons that their family members were uh, chosen for internment include not watching state TV, giving up smoking, traveling to a foreign country, and right now, uh, essentially any Uyghur who returns from a foreign country to um, all known cases, uh, people without dual citizenship returning um, to China uh, and with the disappearance of that person, um, expressing interest in traveling to a foreign country, having WhatsApp on your smartphone. And this is something to remember if you're hearing claims, well, well, no, this is, if, if you're hearing people say, well, this is a way of controlling terrorism or controlling resistance to, to the state. Um, this is what they're actually um, controlling. And I, I also want to point out an a, a, a interesting thing in the photo that Darren um, put up of all the different kinds of clothes you can't wear and appearances you can't have. One of those images is actually taken, uh, is an image of Keanu Reeves, one of the um, uh, bearded images. Because I think in, when it's put in the context of you know, Islamic extremism, it's easy for some people to see a bearded person as potentially a threat, given the Islamophobic um, uh, media environment that we live in. Um, and I think it's quite powerful to point out that one of their examples of what an extremist looks like um, is uh, a paparazzi photo of Keanu Reeves. Okay, um, can, how much time do I have since I failed to time myself? Okay, great. Um, all right, so th that's all I'll talk about for the... Um, for the, uh, uh, the evidence part. I, I want to use the remaining time to make three general points, uh, more interpretive points, and then um, uh, sh show, show you a database project that, um, that I'm working on to help uh, Uyghurs report their friends and, and loved ones who have, uh, have, who have disappeared. So the first general point is one that probably doesn't need much evidence given the presentations that uh, preceded me. Uh, but that is that the, that the camps, for all the emphasis they get in the media, are really one part of a, a larger system of control of the Uyghurs. But they're, they're an extremely important part, not just for the people in the camps, but for their effect on the people outside the camps. As in any place where people are subject to um, extreme efforts of control from the state, uh, in Xinjiang, Uyghurs have long had very creative means of e evading control. Um, uh, the example I like to use is the, uh, uh, the, the, the, the high prevalence of banned books. Books banned by the state are often very innocuous fiction and uh, sort of standard religious text that would you know, not uh, raise any eyebrows anywhere else in the world. But, um, Uyghurs used to have, uh, it was very easy to find banned books in Xinjiang as of five, five years ago. There were whole publishing industries, putting uh, underground publishing industries, making you know, everybody's favorite novels that the state doesn't like. Um, that is gone now, and, and people are now burning their own books. They're now burying their, their own books voluntarily. And the reason is that they now they now know, because they, everyone has had a family member or a friend, or more likely many family members and many friends, disappear overnight without any sort of recourse or, or um, uh, uh, opportunity for appeal. People know very well that they, live, uh, that they live outside the camp solely at the whim of the security services. And so now the game is not so much figuring out how to get around the rules, but rather figuring out how to predict what the rules might be. And you can get a sense from my previous slide of um, reasons used to select people for the camps of how unpredictable these rules might be. You know, it's not, it's not published anywhere that you have to greet official on the street or you might go to the camp. So people are really in, in the business of trying to predict what it is the state 
uh, might not like. And that really serves as a, a, a disciplinary backstop to everything else that's going on. The checkpoints like you, uh, like you see here, um, the high presence of police who get really great cooperation from, um, uh, from Uyghurs because they know that any, at any moment they can, um, they can be disappeared. Um, Darren already talked about that. Rules for um, regulating how people behave in public, public. For example, this sign which says you, you, you cannot pray uh, in public. Um, monitoring of the mosques, which is then where you should pray ostensibly. But of course, if you do pray in the mosque, then you, when you fill out the kind of forms that Darren was talking about, your score drops on how much of a uh, trustworthy um, person you are. And it means that Uyghurs are more, um, what's the right word, in, apparently enthusiastically participating in so-called ethnic unity programs um, where they <clears throat> are compelled to interact with Han and Han um, fellow citizens in a kind of co constrained and artificial um, uh, uh, events. The most extreme version of this is the Becoming Family program in which, according to Chinese state media, over one million um, uh, public employees in China, Han ethnicity, the Han majority, have been sent into Uyghur homes to become fictive family with them. And when they're there, they monitor them. They keep notes on, uh, on their behavior. And uh, in many cases, as Darren Byler's work has shown, test them by doing things like offering them alcohol and seeing if they wince when they take it. And here's, here you can see an image of that. Um, and uh, even going so far as to sleep in their, um, in their uh, beds with them. The, uh, a point that proceeds from this, which I think is re relevant to the academic community and which needs, we need to think about carefully and systematically, is that this is this is a situation in, Uyghurs, in which Uyghurs cannot give consent. Um, and this is important for people who are thinking about doing research in Xinjiang for university um, programs that, that uh, have collaborative efforts with partners in China who engage in research programs. Uh, in Xinjiang, and it's something I think is worth reviewing in our, for example, institutional re review um, boards for research projects. There needs to be some special consideration for Xinjiang, which looks um, has many of the characteristics that that make uh, research in prisons a kind of a red flag for IRB research review, um, namely the inability to con uh, to consent. One other uh, thing I, I want to, uh, uh, my last of my three general points is that I often get the question of, you know, why are they doing this? What is the end goal? What do the leaders um, in the CCP have in mind for this system? Where, where, where are they heading? Obviously, we can't, we can't know that. More importantly, I don't think they know. Um, no one can predict what to what purposes these camps will be put in five years. And we know, historically, that when large infrastructure is built to imprison lots of people based on their um, ethnicity, that often the goals, uh, the goals of those um, camps can change, um, uh, for which reason I think we need to keep our eyes open for the possibility of a, there, there doesn't seem to be a goal of mass killing at the moment, um, but that does not mean that that, that can't be something that uh, that might emerge later. All right, I think I have a few minutes left uh, with which I will um, take advantage of this moment where I think there are a fair number of um, Uyghurs who are in the audience and also, oh, this is the wrong one. This is the source of the, um, the now famous uh, image. That's uh, a story that was passed around on uh, WeChat and promoted by a, a government uh, bureau, but since since the uh, Facebook stream will have a lot of um, uh, Uyghurs watching, I I, I think um, I I want to I want to introduce a um, website that um, has been uh, generously designed by um, a, a company in Germany called Enlightenment, um, which does a, a kind of a mix of database construction and political consulting, 
And this website is designed to allow Uyghurs to report on missing friends and uh, family members. The uh, web address is izdemiz.org. It's the Uyghur for we're searching. Um, I-Z-D-E-Y-M-I-Z dot org. And um, you'll see an incredible data, uh, uh, database project later today um, by Jean Bunin, which is designed to collect the testimonies of, of people who've been in the camps and people whose relatives um, have, been, have been sent to the camps. Those are people who have kind of stuck their neck out and, and risked retribution from the uh, authorities in, in Xinjiang. Uh, and often, actually, that has led to the, actually, the release of their relatives uh, in Xinjiang. But this, this database is designed for a slightly different purpose, which is to preserve the an an anonymity of the reporter um, as much as uh, possible. Um, I hope you all know that uh, every time you go to a website, it's collecting all kinds of information about your computer. And that information can be used to identify you. So um, our uh, security approach here is to um, actually not keep data that we don't want to get hacked. So uh, the amount of data collected is minimal, and the, um, um, the user can actually change uh, whatever data is, uh, is collected to protect their own um, privacy. And um, if you are a non-Uyghur speaker and you try this out and it's not working, that's because there's a, like a, capture, a CAPTCHA thing at the bottom that is a question in Uyghur that you have to answer um, correctly. Um, OK, uh, I, I'll, I'll wrap up there. And I uh, thank you all for your uh, attention. Uh, yes, now please have uh, the three speakers at the front. We'll have our Q&A session, um, but only for maybe 10 minutes. Um, and so at this time, if you have any questions, please come to the two mics that are over here. Um, and we would like to ask that, you know, we only have time for one question per person. So please give everyone the opportunity to ask their question. Um, so your time will be limited at the mic. So thank you in advance for that. Um, but yeah, so we can have our first question. You talked about uh, there are some uh, Uyghurs who speak Chinese who in the internment camp get to kind of work on the textile. And I'm just curious, uh, what about you know, Uyghurs who uh, don't speak Chinese? I mean, what happened uh, to them? And I guess there has to be Uyghur speaking people sort of working, communicating with them in, in the camp, I guess. Yeah, so that's my question. OK, so my understanding, is, and it's somewhat limited because we don't have direct access to the camps, but what my understanding based on interviews from people that have been detained and then, then released is that the camp space itself is a Chinese medium space only. You're not permitted to speak Uyghur in that space. The, the rooms that people live in have microphones in them, and even in some of the images that Ryan was showing from the first batch of propaganda images from the kind of Potemkin uh, camps was um, you could see microphones in them. Um, and people talked about this. The microphones are listening to us, so we can't speak Uyghur. If we speak Uyghur, we'll be punished. And there's also cameras in most of the spaces where they have kind of full access and view of people. And even the bid reports, they talk about this, that they need camera systems that will be comprehensive so there's no blank spaces. Um, so there's kind of complete control inside the camp. Uh, my understanding from people that I know that went to the camps not knowing a lot of Chinese is that they're f one of the main things that they focused on was Chinese language education, learning Chinese. And so you actually have to pass Chinese language exams to move up into the like, uh, most minimum security levels of the, of the system. Um, and then eventually you can graduate or something like that to the forced labor internship program. Um, this is sort of the general sense we have. I don't have a lot of specifics about how all it, it works in every case, um, but this is the general sense I get from it. So even if you don't speak Chinese, you cannot speak Uyghur because of the microphones. Yeah, you and, like and you'll be punished if you do speak Uyghur. <laughs> so, I mean, most people know a little basic Chinese, but they have to learn very quickly uh, how you ask for things in Chinese. Um, they're listening to speeches. Oftentimes, there's distance learning that's happening in some spaces. But they're actually taking Chinese language class like every day.
for, for hours at a time. Mm -hmm. Hi, thank you so much for everything that you've said so far um, and for being here today. I had a question about how we understand that technology has played a really important role in Uyghurs communicating with each other, alerting the status of uh, friends and family who are in these camps across borders. Also, as we, you've talked about, as we'll see more today, uh, the tech, surveillance technology is something which is as the capacity to betray uh, people to you know reveal these sort of so-called extremist thoughts or something which might be subversive to the state. So I'm wondering if you could reflect on how people's relationship to their personal technology, particularly smartphones, has shifted um, in, in how they're, yeah, basically how they're relating to intimately used technology. Okay. Um, sure, sure, I'll answer that. Um, thanks for coming. Good to see you. Um, so my sense from when I was there in April is that people now mostly, especially younger people, have smartphones and they're still using them, but they're using them for political performance in a lot of ways, like on a daily basis or weekly basis, you need to post political content um, showing your loyalty to the state, and so it becomes that sort of space for them. Not having a smartphone and going through a checkpoint where their smartphone is asked for is also looked as, at, as suspicious, especially if you're of a certain age and, and socioeconomic status. Um, some people, I think, try to game the system slightly by like, having a dumb phone, um, not a smartphone. Um, but I think you have to, like, it really depends on your social positionality as to whether or not that's an effective strategy for pushing back against the system. You're right to point out that the technology is both tracking people, but also enabling us to see in real time how these things are developing over time, how information can flow, is flowing around the world. And so there's, there's ways that we can sort of hack the system um, by getting that information and getting it out to the world. Uh, and so that's something that's new in a kind of in, internment camp system is having security technology that's integrated with the world. The market is also doing this. The bid contracts are there that, to give us a trail and let, help us follow the money. Professors Roberts, Beiler, and Thum, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, thank you. You have actually taken a step that very few academicians sometimes take in, in relating to something that is as controversial as the Uyghur issue. My name is Zahir Adil. I'm with the Save Uyghur Project. Um, the question for you is, let's go back a few years to the beginnings of the 2000s. And when the Han Chinese are moving in and they're trying to develop the area commercially, typically, if there have been no attacks as such against the general population, you would think that they would try to actually integrate the Uyghur into economic uh, development. However, the Chinese actually chose to isolate them. Is there any aspect of economic um, um, what do you say, you know, essentially economic genocide in this case, if I might term it as such. Have you been able to formulate any opinions on that? Thank you. Well, um, Uyghurs did not benefit um, as much as, as you might hope from the economic development that's taken place over the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, it's, it was quite, quite normal to advertise positions and say that Uyghurs are not allowed to apply for uh, the positions. And in fact, in basic manual labor uh, uh, employment, a lot of the uh, employees were, were brought in from the interior of China or were migrant, migrant laborers from uh, from the interior uh, of, of, Ch of China. For example, um, if you look at the old city of Kashgar, um, which was destroyed and then rebuilt in a kind of um, uh, Disneyland tourist uh, type of replica of the city, um, a, lot, a, a huge number of the people who were engaged in that rebuilding um, 
were, were Chinese workers from, from the interior. So there wasn't, there wasn't, there doesn't seem to have been a concerted effort, despite uh, a lot of government officials' claims that the opening up the West campaign and the economic developments campaign were, um, were hoped to quell Uyghur dissatisfaction with the state, there doesn't seem to be much effort put in to make sure that that, that economic development would, um, would directly benefit the Uyghurs. Uh, aside from the benefits of roads, expanded electricity, which a lot of Uyghurs in the countryside have, have told me they really appreciate, um, the actual economic activity in creating those uh, was mostly made unavailable to Uyghurs. I can add to this. Um, and I think it's, it's one of the things that's interesting is there was, there was a portion of the Uyghur population that actually uh, did benefit economically significantly during that period. Um, and a lot of those people now, I'm seeing um, them reflect on, you know, people who are maybe outside the country reflecting on social media about their parents, um, and people, also people I've met in Turkey, who are uh, kind of dumbfounded that now they're being attacked because they were kind of trying to, uh, they were trying to integrate and they were benefiting. And uh, I think one of the things that concerns me is that in some cases, I, I think, you know, if you look at what's happening in, in some of the presentations that Ryan and some of the things Ryan and Darren were saying, uh, it seems that the, these camps and who's interned uh, is somewhat arbitrary and uh, somewhat decided on the local level. And I, I, I'm, I don't have any kind of hard evidence for this, but I'm concerned that to some degree, there may be some people that actually have significant amount of property who end up getting in turn, um, and that property may be going to other sources, possibly in the, in the local government. Um, and so that we might be seeing, you know, at least on the local level, not necessarily centrally planned, some sort of land grab also involved in this. Okay, I, I'm, I don't know, it's working. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Denis, I'm Fulbright visiting researcher from Slovenia, former Yugoslavia. I, I have like uh, two short questions, so sorry for that. Uh, uh, if you can compare the situation in U Uyghuristan with uh, what was going on in Tibet, and also if you can co compare the camps after the war, what is, was this like similar what is going on, on now? And the third uh, part is also uh, how can you compare also what is going on with Uyghurs and uh, Hui Chinese? Is there some, uh, some similarities? But for my research focus is uh, most important. I'm thinking about this, how, how Han Chinese think about this? If you go outside the propaganda, do they have information about what is going on? in uh, Uyghuristan? Or is this also the question of, I don't know, that a uh, um, big majority of the Chinese don't know what was going on in Tiananmen Square or something like that? Even, even when, I don't know, if Chinese come here to, to study, uh, maybe you talk with how they feel about this. Is this like, uh, a, they feel like this is attack on their ethnicity, on their country? when you're talking about uh, those things because of the lack of the information. Thank you very much. Do you want to take one of them? <laughs> um, I, I, <clears throat> I'll talk about the Hui and, and uh, Uyghurs. Um, there, so Islam is generally seen uh, by, by the party in China as a foreign religion, and explicitly in policy uh, proclamations as a religion in need of sinicization, in need of transforming to be more uh, Chinese. And that policy uh, not only affects the Uyghurs, but also the Hui, the, which is the, the ethnic group distinguished from the Han most by their, um, by their practice of, of, of Islam. They're, they're Chinese speaking for the most part. 
Um, and so we've seen some increasing pressure on the Hui, and Hui people uh, in some parts of China are quite nervous. Um, it's ranged from the uh, a, a, a widespread, um, what's the right word? It's not demolition, but the transformation of mosques, where they're taking the domes off of mosques, and then in some cases even rebuilding part, the, the, the minarets to look like what the state views as truly Chinese uh, architecture. There, a river has been renamed in, in Ningxia. Um, but even in Beijing, there was a closure of a very important uh, book, Islamic bookstore. Uh, there have been closures of some mosques in Yunnan. So uh, this is, this is the, the, the government's nervousness about Islam in general, which is supported by widespread um, Islamophobia online that often takes the, uh, the, the form of of Han netizens complaining about things being called halal um, or ri ritually uh, pure by Muslims. Um, so yeah, the uh, the Hui are nervous, but they're they have they have a long-standing reputation as being closer to the majority ethnic group and therefore more trustworthy than than the Uyghurs. It's a it's a mix of uh, racism and uh, Islamophobia that. Re results in st stronger attention to the Uyghurs, but also some on the, the Hui. And just to speak quickly about the, the way Han people in other parts of China view this, um, in general, people in China don't know the extent of what's happening there. They maybe have heard that there's more security, that Xinjiang is now safe, and so they can go there to travel. That's something I hear from my own students uh, and their parents talking about Xinjiang. Um, but in general, I don't think they understand the extent to which people have been taken to camps. They think it's exaggerated by the West. Um, and they think the camps themselves are not camps, but actually schools. Even in Xinjiang itself, Han people were telling me that they don't know really what's going on in those, in those camps, or they would call them schools. But they did understand that it's punishment, that they must have done something to go to the camp. Um, and so they do have a sense, to some extent, that there's something going on in terms of like a criminal justice kind of positioning or a criminal, uh, it's a carceral system, um, but not, they can't speak freely about it and so they don't really have a sense of it. Others though, uh, especially people that are involved in the system, see it as a benefit to them that, that now finally the Xinjiang problem is being resolved, uh, the Uyghurs are, are being tamed by the system. Um, and they see it as a success. They like the technology also. They see the technology as like cutting edge and it means that like China is advancing and really protecting their interests. All right, at this time, yeah. I think we're short. Let's thank the panel and... Uh... Thank you. Um, so for the next hour, we will hear ta three talks um, focusing more on the theme of technology. And first, we will have Ms. Jessica Batke, uh, whose articles on the crisis I you know, read almost religiously, I would say, in recent years to get a better grasp of the scale of the crisis. Next, we will have Mr. Gene Bunin, um, whose absolute devotion to the humanitarian catastrophe, as he would call it, um, gives hope to every Uyghur you know, that humanity will triumph one day. Um, and without further ado, Please welcome Ms. Jessica Botke. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks again for having me here. And I hope now that you're fed in the water, we're ready for a session two. Um, I'm here to talk a little bit more about the evidentiary basis for what we know about what's happening in, in the Uyghur region. And Ryan already talked a lot about this. Um, but I'll just say, you know, part of the reason that we have to have this conversation is because the, the Chinese government has made it very difficult to know firsthand what's happening in a lot of these places. It's really hard for independent researchers or journalists to get in there and do independent investigative reporting. Um, but, you know, despite that, there are a number of means at our disposal that allow us to kind of understand the scale and scope um, of this mass incarceration campaign, and indeed be very confident that it's actually happening. As Julia said at the beginning, it's, it's not a controversy, it's, it's actually happening. So what are the things from which we can draw evidence and estimates? And Ryan already talked about one of those, and that's the government say so. That's what they're telling us themselves. So um, that includes the 
procurement documents that he showed you, um, and also their own propaganda. Um, these documents, though, have allowed us, have led us to another really important means for understanding the scale and scope of what's happening, and that is satellite imagery. So these, these notices, these procurement notices or tender notices, a lot of times will give a very specific location uh, for where they'd like to build a facility. And so that allows researchers to go uh, on Google Earth or other satellite um, imagery programs and look at those locations over time. Has this location changed? How so? Uh, when? What was there before? What's there now? And what are some visual markers that we can look for in these satellite images to understand what it is that we're actually seeing? Um, are there things that we can see that indicate that this is um, a place that people are being held against their will and not just some vocational education school? So um, this first example is from a BBC report. Um, and it's a really striking example because it's, it's basically constructed out of whole cloth. You can see this is from July 2015. It's a pretty empty site. And then by April 2018, you have this facility there. Um, the BBC reporters who were doing this actually did go, this, this facility is about an hour outside of Arimchi. Uh, they went there, they tried to go. They, of course, were not allowed to go in. Uh, but what they did once they were in town was just cold call a bunch of random local businesses and ask them what was there. And people did, in, in fact, say it's a re-education school. Um, one person said, yes, that's a re-education school. There are tens of thousands of people there now. They have some problems with their thoughts, in case there's any question what a re-education school is. Um, and then this is, this, so this is the same facility in April 2018. And it's not just that they're being built, but they're constantly being expanded. This image isn't quite as good, but you can see it's much larger. Um, and that's just from April to October. And Darren already talked about how some of these are also having factories added onto them. So it's not just that these, these camps are appearing out of nowhere, but that they're always being expanded, or at least some of them are. Um, so those are new facilities. In other cases, the government has appropriated facilities that were already in existence and modified them to make them suitable for incarcerating people. Um, this comes from Sean Zhang, um, in, who is a law student in Canada, who's done a lot of amazing research on satellite imagery. Um, and you can see this is in Hulja, and, and this is in 2017 on the left, and in 2018 on the right. Um, and you can see that this sports field's been covered over with buildings which are likely um, they could be dorms for inmates. Um, and again, he knows that this is a facility because there was a procurement notice put up asking for bids to uh, do construction in this location. So let's talk a little bit more about what lets people know besides, or at least confirm from the, once you've got the location from the procurement notices, how can you confirm maybe that this is a site? Two of the most really obvious visual markers um, that people are relying on is our watchtowers and razor wire fences. And you can see these. You can see the shadow of the watchtower down there at the bottom um, in an image. This is, again, from, from Sean Zhang's research. Um, interestingly, there was a really good report I recommend everyone take a look at. It came out yesterday by Bloomberg. Uh, and reporters were taken on a tour of a re-education facility, a so-called re-education facility. Um, and of course, the reporters were shown a very happy place where people were learning lots of great life skills. Um, but really interestingly, if you looked at satellite images of that camp last year, you saw watchtowers and razor wire fences. And just before that the reporters were allowed to go in through the, for this visit, there were no watchtowers and razor wire fences. So um, it remains to be seen whether that is something that's going to happen across these facilities now that the Chinese government knows that outside researchers are using these as markers um, to, to determine the, the nature of these facilities, or if that's just something that's temporary that was done for this particular set of reporters. We don't, we don't know yet. OK, so just looking at the satellite images, experts and academics um, have been able to make estimates about how many people could plausibly be held in these locations. Right. So this is, this is back to this example from the beginning, Daban Chang outside Urunchi. Um, the BBC consulted several teams of experts um, with, with relevant expertise, and they came up with estimates of how many people they thought that this, this facility could hold. And on the low end, it was 11,000. 
that number is as large as, is, is on par with the largest prisons on Earth. Um, and that assumes that each inmate would have their own sleeping quarters. Um, from a lot of witness testimonies, we know that's probably not the case. Um, and in fact, one of the experts said that 11,000 is likely a significant underestimate. The, large, the, the high end of the estimate is 130,000 detainees, and that assumes that people are being um, housed in dormitories. So we don't really know, and as, we know, as, as you can see, this is not a very precise estimate. Um, but if you have this kind of capacity, you really don't need a lot of these facilities to start approaching being able to hold a million people, um, incarcerate a million people. Oh. Sorry. In a separate analysis, uh, the Australian Strategic Policy Institute, um, they also went and analyzed 28 facilities, again, looking from satellite images. And they, they saw that just in those 28 facilities, there was uh, 2.7 million square meters of floor space. Um, and again, not all camps are, are the same size. Uh, they're not all that big. But really, if you have something like that, you don't need a ton of those before you're able to start incarcerating um, the, the million figure that people have been citing. OK, so we have the government telling you themselves what these things are. We have cell imagery. And we also have um, extrapolation based on reporting on the ground um, and interviews with people on the ground. So two key studies have independently, or at least as of last year, independently arrived at um, around one million people being incarcerated in these facilities. Uh, the first estimate is from the German scholar Adrian Zenz, who Ryan mentioned earlier. Um, there was a, a, a document that was purportedly, purportedly leaked from public security authorities in Xinjiang. Uh, it made its way to Newsweek Japan. Um, this is part of it, not all of it. Um, and it it said that this shows the counties here on the left, and then this gray column is the number of people incarcerated in each of those places. Um, and it, it, it said that there was uh, nearly 900,000 people incarcerated in 68 counties in Xinjiang as of spring 2018. But this is not a complete data set. Uh, it was missing a number of large population centers. So what uh, Zenz did was he used the figures that were available here to generate an estimated detention rate. Uh, and he generated one estimated detention rate for areas that are um, pro proportionally high in ethnic minority population, and a different detention rate for areas that are, uh, have a higher percentage of Han population, on the assumption that in areas where there's more ethnic minorities, you're going to see a higher rate of incarceration. So he used this estimate and applied it across Xinjiang to include the places that were not in this data set. He came up with about a 10% incarceration rate in, in uh, minority majority areas and 5% in, in Han majority areas. And so he used that to generate an, an estimate of how many people are going to be, or were incarcerated at that time. Um, and he's, he came up with the figure you can see there, uh, anywhere between several hundred thousand and just over one million. Now he's since up updated this, right? Just last month, I think, um, up to 1.5 million. And as you can see, that's nearly one in six uh, people, adult members of, of the ethnic minority community in Xinjiang. Um, he updated this estimate based on satellite images and witness testimony. Um, and the second estimate that we have, similarly, it's an extrapolative estimate done by the, the Chinese human rights defenders. Uh, they called people throughout 2017 and 2018. They called eight different villages in southern Xinjiang, southern Xinjiang being uh, having a higher percentage of, of ethnic minority populations. And this was the, these were the estimates that they got from those interviewees, how many people were detained in their villages. So they used those to, to estimate detention rates. Um, and again, they ended up around one million as an estimate for the entire province of people being detained. And that includes people that are incarcerated around the clock. That number does not include people that are attending daytime or evening time re-education sessions. Um, and even work that doesn't go this far, people that aren't necessarily generating detention-wide or region-wide detention estimates, 
Um, there's still, as was mentioned earlier, people are reporting detention quotas in different areas. So Radio Free Asia, as Ryan mentioned, call, cold calls people. They've done a lot of really great reporting on this. Uh, and they have reported in various areas that local officials have told them that they have a 10% detention quota that they have to meet. They have to detain 10% of the people in that area. One person said 40%. So um, these are all kind of in line with each other. The reporting that we're hearing from independent sources all point to this general um, figure, at least as of last year. And as I mentioned earlier, these are not precise estimates. It's incredibly hard to be precise because people are not allowed to go in and ask questions and do independent um, investigations, but I think that they are credible. Um, and I would also point to State Department estimates. Uh, in March of this year, the State Department said that 800,000 to possibly more than 2 million Uyghurs have been or are being held. The problem with the State Department estimates, of course, is that uh, we can't see the math behind them. We don't know what they're, they're based on. I am really biased. I used to work there. This is exactly the sort of thing that I, I would have been um, working on. So I tend to put a great stock in them, but um, that's, that's me. I'm a biased observer in that case. All right, um, other suggestive trends. What, uh, what other things can we use that strongly support all the rest of the evidence that we have? Um, another one is the arrests that we have seen, a massive jump in arrests over the last few years. So if you look between 2016 and 2017, there was a 700% um, increase in criminal detentions uh, in Xinjiang. And both Chinese Human Rights Defenders and Radio Free Asia report that at least some of these detentions are the result of people that were first held in these camps which, as has been mentioned before, are extra legal. They're outside the judicial system, so people get swept up in a camp, and then they're transferred over to the formal criminal justice system for prosecution. We do not know how many people went into the formal criminal uh, justice system through this mechanism, um, but it's an, it's an incredible amount of people. So even if you, you know, said maybe only 10% of these arrests uh, could be accounted for by people who were first in camps, that's still 20,000 people. Um, if you think that more of these arrests come from people that were transferred over from the camp system, you're looking at hundreds of thousands of people. So again, um, it's not hard to start getting towards a million people being detained. It's a very reasonable estimate for what's happening. Finally, um, another very strong piece of evidence about what's happening in these camps and that gives us an accurate picture of the scale and scope and, and really the nature of what's happening um, our witness testimonies, and that is what Jean is going to talk about next, so I'll leave it there. Okay, um, so uh, thank you, Jessica, for the nice segue. Um, I'm going to do something very cliche first and thank the organizers. So thank you for inviting me to come and speak here. It's very rare that I actually get out to this part of the world. Usually I'm based kind of as close to Xinjiang as possible, ideally in Xinjiang, but I can't really go back there now, so uh, mostly in Central Asia. But still, it's very nice to come here to meet everybody and uh, to see all of you guys and talk to you about these uh, very important issues. So uh, what I'm going to talk about today will be something that I've been working on for the past, let's say more or less full time for the past seven months. So it's a personal initiative and it's kind of my way to try to put, to help put an end to this thing that's happening in Xinjiang right now. And uh, where I wiser, I probably would have started this, I don't know, a year earlier, or maybe, you know, where I really wise, I probably would have started taking, you know, photos of IDs of people that I met in Xinjiang maybe 10 years earlier and just storing them so I could then later, you know, know who they were if, in case they were deten uh, detained, but um, alas, still better late than never. So basically, this is my project. It's, uh, well, it's, it's hopefully will be our project, quote unquote, so more, as more and more people get involved. But it's a victim's database, and it's actually kind of the grueling work of going through the victims who are in Xinjiang currently, in Xinjiang's current reality, or were there at some point recently, and kind of counting them one by one, and List, collecting testimonies about them from relatives and friends abroad, and building that all into a database, which is actually publicly available here at Shahid Biz. So if you have a smartphone, if you have a laptop, and you want to just take it out and kind of browse and play around, you're more than welcome to. I won't be offended. 
Um, so my goal here is really kind of very tutorial. Um, this database has gotten more and more attention recently in the media, uh, among other people, but still I imagine most people in this room probably have not looked at it, do not know how it works, or don't know the fine details, so I'm going to kind of explain that and also justify why I think it's important to have something like this and how you could use it. So um, before I do all that, I'm going to try to confuse you. And so the goal of the slide is to confuse you, but in so doing, I want to impress upon you a very important point. And that's kind of when we talk about Xinjiang in the media and probably you know, conferences like these, we focus on camps. And I think Ryan already mentioned this. It's not really just camps, it's, it's much, much more than that. But if you actually try to dig into how complicated it is, it gets really ugly. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is, I mean, if you want to talk about it and focus on camps, that's totally fine, but at least keep in mind that the whole system, all of Xinjiang today, it's not an understatement, sorry, it's not an exaggeration, it's not an overstatement to say that the whole place is really a big camp. So, um, you know, camps are kind of like one, part of this, and this is kind of like pick your poison. I, by no means, I mean, I could talk about this for hours, and every one of these arrows actually has an argument behind it, and we could talk for hours about every one of these arrows and what the evidence for those is. I don't have time to do that right now, so I'm just going to kind of gloss over all of this. So the camps, uh, or the camp system, because actually there's various types of camps, some more lenient, some closer to, say, prisons. Um, the camps are just one part. Then, of course, you have prisons, the formal prisons, which are another part. Another part that I think has not gotten very much attention, but probably should, is the soas. And soas is a Chinese term. So there's control soa, julio soa, pai chu soa. And these are kind of like the police detention centers. And often they're kind of transit points, so we don't hear about them. But often people go there, and then they get taken to a camp or to a prison. But, and some, sometimes people stay there for quite a while. And so these are kind of like the black holes. These are probably the worst places in terms of things like torture, because their job is often to interrogate, to investigate, uh, to get people to admit crimes. And so these are kind of maybe the worst. This is where you hear like the worst of the stories that come out from Xinjiang. They're often from these saws. And so actually, like Mihir Gul Tursun's testimony, Gul Bahar Jalilova's, Abdul Ayub's, they're actually not from camps. They're from the saws. And I think that's also an important distinction just to keep in mind. Um, but even if you're not in these kind of, let's say, proper incarceration places, you can also, let's say, leave a camp and go to a forced, some sort of forced labor. They can be a factory, but there's also testimonies that talk about people being forced to work as security guards, people being forced to work at the kindergarten, people who, let's say, are teachers normally to go and to teach at one of the camps again. So there's many things that people can be forced to do. Um, and that, too, is a type of detention. Then there's hospitals, some of which are partially converted to camps now. I mean, there are hospitals, for example, where the first, I don't know, nine floors will be normal for normal people and for normal patients, and then everything above that will be for camp, camp detainees. And so that's another type of detention. Then for kids whose parents have been taken, you have orphanages. That's a type of detention because these kids have no choice. They have to go there. Then on top of that, you also have what I've decided to call community correction because it's very similar to the way that minor offenders seem to be treated in China in general. And that's you know, people like drug addicts, for example. You know, they are forced to stay in their community. And they, you know, they, cannot, they cannot leave without permission. They have to go to frequent, let's say, sessions, meetings. And they're constantly kind of watched to see what they're doing. And this is what a lot of people in Xinjiang are in fact, under right now, it's a sort of community correction. So they have to go to flag raising ceremonies, political meetings. They have checkpoints on the streets that constantly check you know, their ID, their phone, and they're constantly being surveilled. So this, too, is a type of detention. This is probably the one that most people are under. And of course, kind of more abstract, um, here I really generalized, but the sort of ultimate form of detention is death, because in most, if not all, of these other forms of detention, people do prematurely die, and that's been documented. I think now in the database we have something like 3,600 testimonies collected. About 62 of those are people who are dead. So it's about 1.5% of the database is dead. So um, here I just want to say that when I'm talking about Xinjiang victims and documenting them, 
we're talking not about just even camps or even you know camps and prisons, but all of this. So uh, why why is there why, why did this database get created? As I said, I would have done it much earlier, but I guess the most simple reason was that in the summer of 2018 there was a rise in the number of testimonies, quote unquote testimonies, very informal testimonies that started to show up from friends and relatives on things like social networks. So these would be very simple. For example, a person could just hold up a phone and say, my name is da da da, my father da da da is currently being held in a camp you know, since April of last year and I want to ask international rights organization, I want to ask the president of my country to help me you know, do something about that. And people would post that on social networks and the problem with that is that people, you know, on social networks, people comment on them, people like them, people share them, and two days later, people just kind of tend to move on and forget them, and they're not, not, not, they're not documented. So in the, let's say, the late summer of, no, I can't go back. In the late summer of uh, last year, there started to be more and more of these coming out, and so the, it seemed like there was a need to you know, do something with them and start to collect them. And I just want to point out something that's actually quite, uh, you know, uh, loud here is that this was in the summer of, you know, I'm, I'm saying in the late summer of 2018, people started talking about this more and coming out and testifying. Whereas, you know, the detentions, they started maybe in the April of 2017, so it took a year and a half after people had been detained already for people to start going out and saying, oh, hey, by the way, my father and my family members are in detention and going public about it, which says something in itself. Um, now, there's a lot of other reasons that kind of went into this, and I will try to quickly gloss over these. I think the most primary reason for why I thought this would be useful was this kind of inspiration, you know, this kind of more abstract goal of inspiring more people to speak out, because it's very, very hard to speak out if there's maybe 10 other people doing it, because as soon as you do it, you're afraid that the Chinese government is going to punish your relatives, or the relatives who are not in detention right now may be put in detention because you went public about your family. But of course, once you have you know, hundreds of these, once you have thousands of these, hopefully once we have tens of thousands of these, it's not as scary, because if you see this big pile of testimonies, you add yours, and then it will be lost. And so it's not such a big step then to add it. And so that was one goal. Another goal was to kind of try to at least symbolically get the different ethnic groups to work together, because this is really funny. I mean, we often, again, we often talk about this as an Uyghur issue. It is certainly not only an Uyghur issue. The Uyghurs have the most victims in terms of abs the absolute number, but relatively speaking, you know, things are just as bad for the Kazakhs, for the Kyrgyz, for the Uzbeks, for the Tatars, and a lot of these other ethnic, for the Hui as well, a lot of these other ethnic, either Turkic or Muslim minorities who live in Xinjiang. But, strangely enough, uh, often Uyghur activists you know, talk about the Uyghurs, Kazakh activists talk about the Kazakhs, Kyrgyz activists talk about the Kyrgyz, and there's not a lot of, I don't know, shout outs, let's say, in between, which um, you know, I feel like that needs to change, at least symbolically this gives a way to take testimonies from everybody, and in fact a lot of the documentation for this has come not from Uyghurs, but from Kazakhs. So about half the database is still Kazakhs. And so this gives a way to kind of put everything together in one place. So sort of kind of Minzu Tuanji, sort of ethnic uh, unity. Um, another reason was to give, kind of get more people mobilized, give more people a way to help, because this was a common question, and it's still a question that I hear, is, you know, this is horrible, what can I do about it, as somebody who's completely out of the situation. And uh, now we currently have maybe 10 to 20 people who are working, you know, volunteering or part-timing for this database project. And, you know, some of them maybe are only doing a few hours per month. Some of them are doing a few hours every day. And these are people who probably would have been doing something else, maybe not even Xinjiang related, had this not come up. And so this has gotten more people involved. It's also crowdfunded, so we run purely on donations. And I think we have something like 200 donors at this point. And so again, that's 200 people who, you know, perhaps they wouldn't know what to do otherwise, who at least have been able to help in this way, so it's, that's another goal. Uh, of course, kind of more concrete, uh, this is another, as Jessica said, this is another form of documentation or proof. So in addition to the satellite images, in addition to the government tenders to the Chinese government's own press, you know, state releases, this is also, testimonies are another type of evidence. 
Uh, it's also a very, it has the potential to be, and I think it already is, a very important analytical and investigative tool. Because if you're a journalist, if you're a scholar, and you want to, say, search about you know, factories in Xinjiang, you can download the whole database, you can search for the word factory, and you can find the relevant testimonies and perhaps find you know, the relevant information. And you can also look at specific demographics. So if you want to look at young Uyghur men from Korla, for whatever reason, then you could also look at those specific testimonies as well and zoom in and kind of look for things there. And the last point for why I think this is important, and this was not here originally. This was not something I had in mind when I started this up in September. Um, but uh, it's something that, because I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know, I, I, I couldn't really call, I wanted more people to contribute testimonies, but I couldn't say, you know, I couldn't tell people to do that because I didn't know, like, will this make their relatives safer or will this make their relatives in more, will this put their relatives in more danger? But I think as time has shown now, China is incredibly, the Achilles heel of the current Chinese authorities seems to be bad PR. And they react very, very badly and very, very comically to, uh, you know, when, some of these cases get publicized, so sometimes you'll get, you know, people released a day after somebody goes and makes a video online and just puts it on YouTube saying, you know, such and such a relative is in a camp. And the next day, they'll suddenly get news that this person's been released after not hearing from them for a year or two. And, you know, sometimes that seems like a strange coincidence, but there's dozens of such cases. And that also allows us to be a watchdog. So if you create, if you file a testimony for somebody, you put it in there, we now have a file, we can keep track of that case. And if, God forbid, something happens to them, if they die, for example, we can also note that, we can try to publicize that, we can give that to somebody, we can give it to journalists, etc. So like I said, it's a, uh, it's a website. Shahid Biz is literally witness we, or we are witnesses. And being a website, uh, this is kind of a public website, so everything is public. You can read all of these testimonies, all the names are public, all the Chinese ID numbers are public, and that's kind of the point. And uh, so anybody can read all the testimonies. Like I said, anybody can export them and do whatever they want with them. Um, and anybody can submit, and this is kind of, uh, it takes five to two, maybe five to 15 minutes. I'm going to do a demo at the end where I'm going to submit a testimony in real time, so to speak. And um, I strongly encourage people who, I mean, I'm sure there are people here who are friends or relatives who are in that sort of, you know, in Xinjiang in some sort of detention, I strongly encourage you to write a testimony for them. However, that being said, even though anybody can submit, the majority of the content is not just people going on the website and submitting testimonies. The majority is still kind of this grueling work that, let's say, that we do, that the volunteers do, that the part-timers who work for this do, and that's kind of parsing the internet for publicly reported cases of victims. So that can be on, through video testimonies on YouTube, that can be through social media posts, that can be through media, just traditional media and also NGO reports. So we just kind of, we look at everything, we find victims, we try to get their story and we put them into textual format and we throw them into this database. And that's over 90% of the current, of the database right now. I would like that to change. I would like more people, of course, to go and submit directly. But, you know, for the time being, this is okay also. So a typical testimony looks something, let's say, like this. So you have a textual component where you write all the stuff. You write who the testifier is. You write who the victim is. You write something about the detention. You write about the victim's current status, if you know it. There's also a metadata component where you tag and you categorize kind of the victim. So you, you give them an age category, you give them a gender category, and that's what makes it possible to do all the analytical work, kind of the other component of this, uh, of this project. Then we are not uh, anonymous, so if you're anonymous, you can go to Ryan's, for example, database, like he explained. We are completely public, again, that's the point. So if you want to testify, you have to put your full name of the victim. And if uh, you can, we strongly encourage putting the Chinese ID number because that's how you let somebody, that's really how you can go to say the Chinese authorities and point a finger at a particular victim and say, where is this person right now? And uh, you can't really do that if say, you know, if you say that, well, my friend Mehmet Tursun from Kashgar is in a camp. They'll say, well, we have 5,000 Mehmet Tursuns in Kashgar, which one do you want? And then they can pretend that they don't know. But with a Chinese number, they can't really do that. And so then, then in addition to that, there's also supplementary materials, so video, audio, blah, blah, blah. So here I'm just going to go and show a few examples. So 
The site is not very beautiful. That's also maybe kind of the point, because it's really more about functionality at this point. But this is a screenshot of one testimony. And here again, you have the name. Here you have kind of all the metadata. And then here you have the textual part. And then here you have any supplementary stuff, which is in this case, a video. So this is kind of a very, let's say, bare bones testimony. There's not a lot of information in here, in fact. But they can also be quite complex. So this is an example of a testimony that has a lot of info, a lot of updates, a lot of multimedia, audio interviews, pictures, certificate you know, scans, numbers, et cetera. And um, so I would like to submit one and show you how it's done. But before I do that, um, I want to just touch upon this um, issue of reliability. So it's not, at least in my opinion, of course, enough to have one or two testimonies and say that these are facts. You can never say testimonies are fact. It's a type of evidence. but. A testimony from one or two people is not a fact. It's just what people say. And we don't claim to do more than that. We don't claim to report facts. We just report what people write or say, period. So we don't try to, we don't try to extrapolate and draw things out of the testimonies. We just try to report what people say, ideally. Um, of course, when you have hundreds of these, then it's up to you as a, I don't know, an informed reader to kind of go through these and make your own conclusions about what that means. And if hundreds of people are saying that they're doing such and such, then there's probably you know, reason to believe that they're really doing such and such. That being said, even for individual testimonies, it's possible to corroborate some things. It is possible to build further on the things that we have in a given testimony. So here I'm going to give a sort of very tragic and very almost outrageous ex example that I was personally very skeptical about, but then that, that which ended up kind of getting more corroborated and which made me a lot less skeptical. And so this is a testimony, again, for a Kazakh, Akhil Kazuz Ule. So this is, um, again, this is the screenshot. The original testimony came through these YouTube kind of video interviews from, from his uh, friends and relatives in Kazakhstan. And I'm going to kind of tell you his story the way that they told it. So this is not me telling you facts. This is just me kind of narrating what they themselves uh, talked about. And so he was a government-appointed imam in Chanji Prefecture, not far from Urumqi. He, at one point, was arrested. He was tortured. They say it was in a camp. I suspect probably it was a control, so it was a, probably a pretrial detention center. But they say camp, so OK, we'll write camp. Uh, he was then, he fainted, apparently, after 20 days of this. He was sent to a hospital for 10 days. He was released. He was allowed to go home. And after returning home, I think he was home for only two or three days, and he told them that he would have to go back to detention again. And so this is where the testimony gets really crazy, and this is where the skepticism, skepticism should come in. His wife, in an attempt to save him from going back to detention, killed herself. So she committed suicide. And what happened was basically she committed suicide. He didn't know about it. He woke up in the morning, I think, on the day that he was supposed to go back to detention. He found the, out the door of the house locked. Again, I'm just reporting what people here were saying. He found the door locked from the outside. Some neighbors helped him get out of the house. They went in the yard. They walked around. And they found her body in a methane production well of the house. Ironically, this does not save him from detention. What happened instead was that the authorities came and they accused him of murdering his own wife and sentenced him to 30 years in prison. Again, this is what his relatives said when I first heard it. I was also a bit skeptical. You know, This is the kind of story It sounds so extreme that Xinjiang is quite bad, but it's not, it can't be that bad everywhere. You know? But um, what's interesting is that when one of our researchers, we have, again, his Chinese name in here, one of our researchers looked for his Chinese name, or one of our part-timers looked for his Chinese name on the Chinese internet and found first an article that he himself had authored less than three weeks before detention, which showed that you know, it was a very pro-government article by an imam. It was, all, it was the right location. It was the right name. So at, first, at the very least, this proved that this person exists, that this person existed. And then there was another announcement from the procuratorate uh, of how this person was arrested for murder and was now being investigated. And so suddenly, you know, this story, which at the beginning may have been very, sounded too out, very outlandish, did not seem so outlandish anymore. And now, to take it even one step further, when all of this ends, 
And I don't think it's a question of if, I think it will end. The question is when, but when it will end, you know, you could end, you could, we have his address, you could go to this house and you could look, for example, is there a methane production well in that house? And if there is, that corroborates it even further. So this is an example of one testimony and how you can potentially build upon that with other evidence. But so now I will finish with a demo. And so I'm actually going to submit a testimony right now for a friend of mine who was actually arrested two years ago. So again, the time lag here should be amazing, right? It's, you know, two years have passed, now I'm finally submitting a testimony for him. Um, so this is somebody who was arrested two years ago and I couldn't submit a testimony for a very long time, even after I started this project, because I simply didn't know his last name. And that's kind of a problem a lot of people have, is we, have, we might have people in Xinjiang that we know, but we actually, we never ask, we never take pictures of their IDs, we don't know their last name, we just kind of talk to them on a first name basis. And um, so this person is, he was a bookstore owner, a bookshop owner in Kashgar, which is this kind of most westernmost town in Xinjiang and in China. This is kind of a goofy picture of the two of us from 2015. So his name is Abdul Ghani. He's retired, he's from Kashgar as far as I know. He was running this bookshop that sold mostly Uyghur literature um, after retiring, and uh, he was running it together with his son. This is a photo from Baidu Street View of the bookshop still in 2016. And I think this is as recent as you can get with Baidu Street View in Xinjiang is 2016. After that, there's no fresh images. So here's a photo of some kids in his store during off school hours. Here's his kind of VChat uh, background photo. And so I found out that he had been detained, that he had been arrested in November of 2017. I came back to Kashgar in September of 2017 that year. The bookstore was closed for two months, then suddenly it opened. I was able to talk to people who knew him better. And they told me that yeah, in April of that year, he had been arrested, sentenced to seven years in prison. And his son had been taken away as well. His son was in a camp, so kind of an open camp where people could still come and occasionally visit him. But in Abdul Rani's case, he was in a prison, not even in Kashgar, but apparently in Aksu, in a closed facility. And you know, nobody knew what was happening with him. And again, this is a retired bookshop owner. Uh, so then I also went, you know, I have his VChat, I looked on his VChat, and that actually corroborated it because then you look on his VChat and his posts stop in April 2017. And if you look at his last post, if you look at his last post, uh, people who are familiar with Uyghur literature will see this is Iz and Oyhan Zimin. So these are kind of very popular historical novels that are banned. Now, of course, but I think they were already banned by 2017, but a lot of people just didn't know. I think some, somebody already mentioned, you know, a lot of literature was banned, but people could still get it or sell it. And so he had posted this thing where he said, you know, I got the first edition, so the first editions of these are very, very valuable because books like these go through censorship and editing, you know, lots and lots of times, you know, dozens of times sometimes, and these were the first editions. And so he kind of said, he said, you know, this is great, you know, this, the, they're, they're clean, they're in good condition. It was kind of a sort of advertisement, and this was the last thing he had posted before I assume he was taken away. So again, I didn't know his last name for a very long time. I couldn't, uh, I couldn't write a testimony for him. But about a week ago, a friend and I actually searched, again, the wonderful Chinese internet, and uh, we found the actual bookstore in Kashgar in that location with all the kind of everything matches, and we found his name. So it's, Abdu, it's actually Abdulhani Abdullah. And so now I'm going to write the testimony for him. And so I've done all the kind of the grueling work so you don't have to go through it. And so this is kind of, I'm just filling in the fields. I'm the testifying party. This is my testimony. I'm not submitting for anybody else. He's a friend, somebody I've known since 2014. Here I've kind of wrote, written all his stuff, included his Chinese name. Um, then the location, somebody told me that he was in, somebody who knew the situation, knew he was in a closed prison in Aksu arrested in April 2017. For the reason for the detention, I can only speculate, but again, books were probably the reason, but you know, again, we don't know the official reason. Victim status in a prison in Aksu. I hope he's still you know, alive. We don't know. And, um, boom. and then, you know, how did I learn about it? I learned it from somebody who knew the situation firsthand. 
and then some extra information. His son was also detained, and the bookstore is now closed. So having done all that, I'll just very quickly conclude. Um, so then if I go now to this website, again, so here's the website. I click on the Submit tab, which I already did, and you get this form, which I've already filled out with the content I just talked about. So you kind of fill out all the stuff. Not, not all of it is mandatory, but I put in all of it. And then this is kind of where you do the metadata. So you know, age, I don't know his exact age. Gender, male, ethnicity, Uyghur. Location, well, not surprisingly not in Kashgar, but in Aksu. Detention type, formal prison. Detention time, April 2017 in that period. Detention reason, I can speculate, but I don't, know if, I don't really know, so I'm going to leave it unclear. Health status, again, he had no health problems when he was detained. But, you know, of course I worry about that, but, you know, for the time being unclear. Profession, he had his own private business, so I will put private business. I don't have his ID number. Um, and then I'll just enter my contact email. This is just how we don't display this information, but you know, if we want to get back to you and kind of ask you for additional info or other stuff, this is what we do. And then if, you know, if I had any additional info like pictures, which I had here, I can then send it to this email. So then you know, I submit a testimony. It says testimony submitted and it goes through. And then it is added to the pending list with all the other pending testimonies, and this is another one, and then his should be right here. So then, then when I go home, I'll log in as an admin, for example, and I'll just I'll check this testimony, I'll make sure everything's fine, I'll make sure nothing's missing, and then I'll accept it, and it'll be added to this kind of pool of, you know, so it'll be number 3,641. Uh, okay, so uh, that's it, thank you. Thank you.